and they'll see me doing something and they'll like pause and like try ah. to figure out what's like, did they do something wrong? Like, <laughs> don't worry about it. Welcome back to the Side by Side Guys Off-Road Podcast. I'm Big Z, and we're back in the studio for the first official interview show of the year. Um, last uh, episode was kind of a, a downer episode, but we're back. We're excited. We're out of surgery. Things are looking up. Everything's looking good. And uh, I'm excited to get back in the seat and start talking to people. And I'm sure you're all excited to start getting content back in your stereos and in your ears. Um, today, we have a special guest, somebody I've been trying to get on for better part of a year um uh on the show because just because he's doing something so unique and, and different than everybody else um we are bringing on somebody from the other side of the world in my opinion i'm up northwest washington uh today it's it's a uh, below freezing blowing cold wind 50 miles an hour in snow uh and he's down here in uh, i think southern florida uh enjoying some great mm -hmm. weather so uh today we are uh, excited to bring in uh ryan goldberg from shadow six racing uh how you doing bud Fantastic. Awesome, man. Thank you for having me on. Yeah, I'm super stoked to talk about kind of what you're doing and the history behind it and um, kind of dig a little deeper into who you are, what the company is, you know, how this all started, things like that. If for those that don't know, sure. um, Ryan and his team are the inventors of the Typhoon AUV, which is that uh, razor body on top of a couple jet skis um, that have been tearing up the waters of Florida and the coast, uh, making lots of uh, social waves. Huh? Huh? You see what I did there? Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, and I'm excited to Definitely learn more about stuff. that. Uh, so Ryan, give us a little bit of a kind of a history of like, you know, where do you come from, where you're at specifically, uh, kind of where you got your start in power sports and, uh, let us know a little bit about the, uh, younger you. Yeah. Uh, so the younger me, I've always been an entrepreneur I've always been a self-starter. Um, always just decided to kind of go after doing whatever it is I want. Um, so that's taken me into a whole bunch of different fields and career paths. And so, um, you know, my kids always, you know, sort of confront this question. I get, you know, people ask me, well, what do you do for a living? Um, and I tell them it's kind of hard to explain. And they're like, oh, it's, you know, it's okay. Hold your head up and, you know, shit will work out for you. You'll get a job. <laughs> that's commonly like, my no, response no, when people ask yeah. me is, is, what do you do? Yeah. I, well, you know, things. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like, I don't know. So yeah, uh, my oldest son's like, well, just tell him what you do. I'm like, well, what is that? And he's like, well, you make things happen. I'm like, okay, like what? And he says, well, whatever he wants. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, I just go with what he tells people now because I'm like, you know what, you're 10, but that makes more sense than anything I've come up with so far. <laughs> so but, what um, was, uh, yeah. what was like the younger you, like, where do you, where do you come from? where did you go to school and all that kind of stuff? Ah, uh, so, uh, been a musician since I was probably five or six years old. And so I've always loved music and tearing apart, uh, RC vehicles, electronics, whatever I could and turning it into different things. Um, you know, I see a toy from a movie or something and I want it and they don't make it, you know, my mind goes straight to how can I create that from whatever's out there floating around in the world. Um, you know, I guess my parents would probably tell you I was a bad kid, but you know, I think I was pretty straightforward. Um, a lot of people are surprised to find that, uh, going through grade school, I was a CD student. I definitely did not do well. Um, you know, and then I met my wife when I was 16 and, uh, fortunately, it was one of those scenarios where um, report cards had just come out, and then I found out that her mother was an English teacher, and I'm like, oh, shit, so this means she's going to ask me how I did on my report card. The good news is it's too recently <laughs> now for her to ask yet, but it's coming in, you know, in three months, <laughs> so I sort of turned myself around at that point, uh, you know, and then ended up at Ohio State University, uh, double major in marketing and finance, got my master's there, all as part of uh, one program. But uh, my background is not really in, in engineering. So, um, you know, the engineering stuff has kind of always been something that's come from both um, tinkering with things and going online and learning, and then uh, coming up with big ideas and having very intelligent engineers telling me what I don't know. And rather than ignoring them and arguing with them, I went home and tried to learn as much as I possibly could about what they told me I didn't know about. And the good news is that cut out years and years of mechanical engineering work and electro <laughs> electrical engineering work that I otherwise would need to know about, but probably would never use in reality. Right. Um, it's kind of funny to see that in real life and how that pans out. But uh, 
you know, sometimes knowing what you don't know and not knowing too much is a valuable thing. But, One um, of the things that I tell guys when it comes to like, like trying to figure out what to do for a career, it's like the majority of careers outside of like a doctor or somebody like that, you know, yeah. college is more about insurance <laughs> than anything else. It's about yeah. covering their butts when they're actually practicing whatever craft they're doing. Yeah. It's a place to be while you figure out what you want to do next, I guess. You know, learn to interact with people that you otherwise probably wouldn't want to interact with and do it in a way where you have to. But uh, so, you know, that was college for me. Um, and, were you in power you know, sports? Guess, like, were you into off-roading or doing stuff back then as well? So uh, I guess when I was probably seven or eight years old, I saw a Yamaha Banshee and I started wanting one. And, uh, you know, I eventually talked my parents into like little 50cc vehicles and like the 73 wheeler um, you know, a couple little Yamahas and they were always like, are you nuts when it came to the Banshee? Um, and then they had this idea where they would have me mow lawns for them at an apartment complex they owned. And I realized it was commercial equipment. So I, I worked it out with guys that didn't have that opportunity and let them use the trailer and the equipment and do all the work. And I got myself a Banshee by <laughs> essentially sitting on my ass. <laughs> so you started the uh, whole uh, entrepreneurial thing quite early to get what you needed. Yeah. Basically so. And my mom was like, this is going to be the downfall of you. And you're the only child we worry about. And I'm like, what are you worried about? Like, <laughs> it's a pretty solid play I just had there. I mean, I'm the one driving on a new Banshee right now. Right. I don't have any friends that have them. But, uh, you know, I guess that mindset didn't really change and not in a bad way. I mean, you know, the reality is the typhoon wouldn't exist without all of the people that have been involved in putting it together. I mean, there are so many different people that have played key pieces in making things happen that you know, uh, anybody who thinks they can build the world themselves is a fool. Right. But, um, you know, so, um, I, so, you know, I, I guess, yeah, go ahead. So I was going to say, it's just like, so, so you already had that mindset. You started uh, going mm -hmm. to college and now, and I'm assuming in college at some point there was some sort of business thing going on in the background to make things happen on the, uh, I, I take you as more of a keep grinding, keep pushing yeah, type of person. I did. So I became a hardcore tech guy and, uh, both was in love with tech in terms of using uh, software and coding and things like that, but uh, also investing in the stock market. And so, um, you know, I kind of took this huge wave through college where, um, you know, oddly, I started with very little money, but it turned into an awfully large amount of money, basically investing in the companies today where it would cost, you know, a couple hundred dollars or a few thousand dollars per share, um, you know, but I was buying it back in whatever, 2000, two, three, four, um, you know, and that kind of segued into seeing the market potentially crashing and everybody talked about the tech bubble. And, uh, then I decided to go into the mortgage business, um, you know, basically buy up a mortgage bank. And that was at the time that rates were around 8% and they started dropping on down to 4%. And, um, you know, that certainly did very well for me and carried me through, you know, some of my early twenties. Um, then started getting into developing real estate and trying to kind of expand, you know, the different types of things I was doing. And I guess that sort of culminated in 2008, uh, I guess when my wife finished her residency, uh, she's actually a plastic surgeon. So, um, you know, it seems like one of those things where it would be a, an instant success thing. You go to med school, you become a plastic surgeon, life is great, but, um, you know, her experience coming down here to Florida was significantly different from that. Um, you know, I'm guessing she was working 80, 90 hours a week and making $55,000, $60,000 a year. And she did that, you know, kind of renting office space from other physicians for a couple of years. Um, and, you know, really in the second year that I started kind of just telling her, you know, look, I mean, you can look at this as, as practicing medicine, but the reality is you're in the business of medicine and that's, you know, nothing to be ashamed of. That means customer service. That means a whole bunch of things that you might not normally think you need to worry about in medicine. But, you know, in my opinion, that'll significantly shift things. Right. Um, you know, and, and so, uh, literally it went and I, you know, ended up, uh, leasing her first office space, got a jackhammer, built the entire thing myself because she was scared <laughs> of taking on any debt for it. And today, uh, we probably have one of the largest solo physician cosmetic surgery practices, uh, you know, most likely in the world, I would say definitely in the US, um, because we see comparisons to other offices and whatnot. But, uh, you know, that's sort of segued into building surgery centers, 
uh, a lot more complex real estate. And so I guess that's where, you know, having the insane idea of, okay, fine, I'll you know, make an owner's manual happen. I'll get, you know, all of these different things lined up that it takes to become a manufacturer. Um, and then, you know, for some reason I'm now doing it again, but, um, you know, I, I think it's all these weird little experiences that I have as I, I go through just solving problems where I pick up things that become very relevant later in life. Um, so, you know, it's not always, uh, you know, what you're going to do with what you're learning then. I mean, the surgery centers are great. Um, certainly was time well spent learning about that, but I think that also really helped in the process of creating the uh, Typhoon and, and more importantly, um, you know, becoming a manufacturer. So, you know, I know you had alluded to the length of time it took to get a hold of me. Um, a lot of people thought I disappeared or didn't quite. Well, know I thought you, you know, on. rolled the thing over in the water and were, you know, swimming with some fishes somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I tried my damnedest. I try every time. I swear to you. I mean, the thing is, it's it's a like a it's a bad joke, uh, just because of all the flotation material. But yeah. uh, in one of the early prototypes, I actually cut the exhaust off filled the entire thing up with water. And I think there's some videos floating around of it, but you know, people are asking me, well, why didn't you document this? Cause I was making it for me, not right. really to sell it to the mass market at this point. It was never you know, a I social just, media blitz. It was just this project. Not at all. Yeah, exactly. It was just this project. And you know, I, I knew I could go out and go pick out nice toys and buy myself whatever, but I didn't want to be that guy pulling up in front of a restaurant. Like, it's my car. Yeah. You know, um, you know, it's unfortunately sort of happened anyhow. I just <laughs> pretend like it's not my car and hide. So let's, <laughs> but, uh, let's, uh, let's jump back a little bit. How did you get into this power sports stuff? Like where, I mean, you said you were so, in the Banshees and stuff, and then you were transitioning through this business si side of your life going through everything. I'm assuming at some point there was this, like, I need to get away, escape experience, you know, some thrills and yeah. have some adrenaline. So, yeah. So, uh, I would thought, some, yeah, I, I hit this period where I think I was like, you know, I have everything I want, but the ability to smile, you know, I, I've got <laughs> right. great family, great, everything else out, you know, I should be able to buy whatever I want to, but, uh, you know, I want something that's going to be fun. And, you know, I guess motorsports is one of those things that I forgot about, you know, it just became a, okay, it's too much of a pain in the ass to have this toy or that toy. Um, you know, I'd always buy a four wheeler, end up not really using it. And, you know, I guess it's just because, you know, living in Florida, it's a lot different than Ohio, where I came from when, you know, I was a kid, I could ride down the street on four wheelers and nobody cared. I could ride for hours through the woods, never see anybody else. Um, and there were places to ride, you know, and that kind of dried up. And so, um, you know, after moving down to Florida, you know, I just kind of had this whole you know, it'd be great to get a street bike, but there's no way I'm driving on the roads with other people in Florida on a sport bike. Um, <laughs> you mean you know, Florida's it's a straight not death just like a crazy new place that everyone doesn't no. know what they're doing? No way, man. <laughs> I'm not getting on a motorcycle here on 95. But, um, you know, I guess, you know, kind of the segue into power sports happened with the Typhoon. Um, you know, my son, who's now 10, that I was talking about, would, uh, had, you know, had his third birthday. And I decided for his third birthday, we'd do a guy's trip to Las Vegas. Um, you know, <laughs> Wait, hold on a second. Point, hold on. His third birthday and you're already introducing him to yeah. Vegas. <laughs> yes. And he could speak completely clear sentences and could change his own diet. Well, actually he was potty trained at that point, but he dressed himself, brushed his teeth, like did his own hair, ordered his own food at restaurants. I mean, it was like going with a dude that was my age. <laughs> so, uh, except one that like way more women were interested in. So that was also <laughs> kind of cool. You know, we roll down the script and people are like, you know, double take, like what the hell? Okay. <laughs> you know, and then he just rips off a conversation with them and you know, all is good. But, uh, you know, the last day we were there, I asked him what he wanted to do and he wanted to rent a Polaris razor. And, you know, it was kind of this moment for me where I was like, holy shit. Yes, dude. I was waiting for this <laughs> moment in my life where like I had, you know, I had a kid. Proud dad go moment right around. there. Proud dad moment. Yeah. Yes. Finally, something I want to do. <laughs> and, you know, we can say it's for him, but, you know, the truth is, you know, I know this is just as much for me. But, uh, you know, we went to this Las Vegas uh, Razor Adventures, I think it might have been what it's called. Um but uh we end up going out and running this razor and, and you know basically taking a tour but 
the whole time I'm kind of amazed because we're cranking into stones and whatever, and you know we're following a guide, so it's clearly the path that we're supposed to be taking. But uh, you know, I'm kind of just my mind is blown because I had never driven a side by side before. But this thing just went over it like an airboat, and I'm kind of like cringing, expecting to smash into these logs or whatever sitting there, and it just boop right over it like a cruise ship. And you know, my son's sitting there, just you know, three years old, holding on to the OSHA handle with a giant smile on his face. Uh, you know, and then I was like, all right, well, that's it. You know, my mind's made up. I'm getting one of these. <laughs> this is definitely badass. This is, you know, like I haven't had a smile on my face in a long time. And this was money well, well spent as far as I'm concerned. Um, so I decided I'm coming home and I'm buying myself a side by side. And I'm like, wait a minute. You know what I mean? I have cars in the garage, so I can't really hide a trailer in there. <laughs> And I don't really live in a place where having a trailer with trailer and four wheelers outside or a side by side on it is really going to go over too popularly uh, with the neighbors. <laughs> the, H- the HOA doesn't have a uh, trailer clause on the yeah. on the it's so cold as heck. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, if they don't like the pickup truck, that's fancy. I mean, they're definitely not going to like the side by side on the trailer. The, <laughs> you the, know, the burnout marks along the road aren't going to really tie in well with the paint scheme of the neighborhood. Exactly. Exactly. It's a Key West theme. I feel like that's Key West like, but you know, others might disagree. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you know, so I'm like, well, all right. If I don't end up getting a trailer for it, then I need to make it street legal. And then I'm picturing myself kind of pulling up to red lights and you know, sweating my ass off, and thinking like, am I really gonna do it that much? Because um, at the same time, I also got a banshee and turned it street legal. And, you know, it was one of those things where I got a license plate on it and all my turn signals, everything. And from that moment, a police officer like never looked at me again. You know, I right. pull up to lights and I'd like wave just waiting for like, hey, do you have a license plate or something? Well, Nothing. it's not kind of like Atlanta, <laughs> right? Where if you see one on the street, you expect a big takeover going on. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. I mean, they couldn't have cared less. So, um, you know, I, I kind of backed away a bit from the razor idea. And then I ended up going out uh, a couple months later with my wife to um, the Bahamas. And when I'm there, I'm like, okay, well, you know, I really had a lot of fun when I rented this Polaris razor with Lane and, you know, let's go get a wave runner. So we get on the wave runner and we ride out and, you know, it's kind of butts nuts. So I can't hear a damn word she's saying to me, you know, I'm just kind of smiling and, you know, thinking I'm having the time of my life. And, you know, uh, I get out there where I finally slow down because at my age, you know, you make it about a mile on a wave run and you're like, (laughs) (laughs) like, this sucks. (laughs) Uh, You know, and so I kind of had that reckoning. I'm like, okay, I kind of like this, but dude, this does suck. I mean, riding across waves at my age isn't the same as it was at 20 years old. It's a workout. Um, You know, but yeah, exactly. So, you know, I end up, you know, listening to my wife says, and she's like, turn around now. Like, why? She's like, because my face is getting sprayed with salt water and my legs are burning <laughs> like hell. And I'm like, okay, you know, why can't you like cover your legs up or whatever? And she's like, dude, I shaved my legs for you. You can sleep alone tonight if you want, or you can turn around and bring the wave runner back. <laughs> and I'm like, all right, whatever, fine. $500 down the drain, take the wave runner back. And, you know, as she's kind of complaining, I'm kind of like in my brain just modeling what could you drive around that would have all the thrill of the fastest things out there that, you know, nobody's going to be bouncing around like they do in a cigarette boat because everybody hates you when you go fast in a fast boat. Right. You think they're all loving life and smiling, but you know, they stop and their hair's all tangled up and mascara running past their face. And they're like, what a fucking a-hole. Right. Um, so, you know, uh, I kind of pictured this whole combining the two together. Uh, and that, segued into essentially drawing it up on paper and showing a friend of mine who did a lot of custom car fabrication that I essentially wanted to make, uh, you know, this buggy that, you know, had suspension and ran on jet propelled skis. And, you know, everybody that I said that to kind of looked at me sideways. And so I was like, okay, I want to make a razor strapped to two jet skis. And as soon as I said that people were, you know, at least like you're crazy, but they knew what I was talking about. You know, um, a, a good idea is completely clear and, and understandable from the very beginning, it, whether it's crazy or not. If it's a good idea, you can understand exactly what their person's envisioning. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, for me, I was like, well, OK, if people need to hear a razor and need to have something that looks like a wave runner, I can handle that, you know, and you know that will probably get people to accept what's going on a little more because 
it's already it's very difficult to understand what the intent of the full uh, of the vehicle entirely was um you know but uh you know i started going and, and showing these drawings to my buddy who's an engineer and he would shut me down and when you'd sit out at these campfires drinking and you know whatever hanging out bs and having cookouts and next time i'd come and tell him like all right you know i figured out a solution and here's how we're going to build this thing uh you know and then i was met with no peers the next <laughs> thing you don't know about when it comes to physics or <laughs> you know a whole bunch of other shit, geometry I'm like okay well that's fine all right so each time you know i'm gonna go home take my notes and you know then i'm gonna get it right i'm gonna learn whatever the hell it is he says that i don't know what i'm talking about and then i'm gonna come up with a way to make this thing that segues into him eventually hitting a point where like okay i can't shut you down from a from a field of study aspect but you know I, my mind is kind of blown that you spent this much time coming up with answers for all the reasons i've told you it won't work um but uh you know at that point he was like okay you know you're insane and but i'm willing to waste 30 grand with you building one of these things so um you know that first one was one where uh you know i decided i'm gonna make one and convert it out of a of a jet ski and convert it you know out of uh traditional materials so uh, it wound up becoming kind of a frankenstein sort of chop up of a bunch of things um some did it always from whatnot. the beginning have two jet skis under the suspension or was it ever like it did no it was always two jet skis under the suspension um the first one i made though was kind of you know it was kind of a it took a really long time to get there and when i was done it's like showing up to glamis dunes and seeing everyone there with a thousand horsepower and you brought your john deere gator without sand tires <laughs> right you know so yeah hopefully that analogy makes sense but you know i, I get done with this thing and um you know, it was sort of a proof of concept slash i'm probably never going to play with this toy anyhow so let's see what happens um you know and then you know it's kind of uh you realize that you figured a lot of things out when it comes to engineering but there's a whole lot of shit that you didn't figure out yet and um you know i realized at that point it was definitely a cool idea and something worth exploring further but uh you know not something that was going to be a year or two or three or even four <laughs> year journey because you know it's just not possible i mean everybody says oh i'm gonna make one next summer and yeah my hat's off to you because i literally have people that build rockets that go to space helping me and they don't know how to do it any faster um and we have fireproof wire for that matter and you don't even know what that is so how the hell are you going to make this stuff <laughs> over the summertime i right. just don't get it uh i mean just the time and designing a, a frame from scratch and cad uh you know there's certainly time and, and a lot of cost involved with that and um i think there's you know, also just the understanding of like this is not people people see it for the first time they see it running yeah. through the water they see it doing their thing it doing the thing but what they don't realize is that you know it's pretty much just the shell of the razor and then a ton of engineering underneath it right like the yeah, and, and the the ability for it to stand up and look cool is one thing anybody can bolt yeah. on something to make it look cool but to be a functional yeah. safe and high performance vehicle is a completely different world oh no question about it um, you know, and that's kind of where we went from prototype number one to number two to number three, and then uh, ultimately ended up being a final production build, which is the gray one that you see today. Um, you know, as you know, if you take the plastics off of anything, it's just a bunch of mounting tabs that can be placed anywhere. Yep. Um, you know, and with that first vehicle that, you know, the world saw, that was one where you know, I kind of went back to the drawing board and I hooked up with a guy that's really big in stand up jet ski racing. And I knew that he would have a pretty good understanding of some of the things I wanted to accomplish. And, you know, I guess be able to assure that, you know, some of the theoretical things with the holes would play out the way that they needed to. So, um, you know, that segued into engineering really jumping in milestones um you know and bringing in the help of a lot of outside people for that matter um the halls are not stock gp 1800s we buy two brand new gp 1800s we got all the electronics out of it that's it um we never start out with a side by side there are no polaris razors harmed in the making of these <laughs> um it's not even polaris razor plastics on the side it's myoplastic 
it's just, you know, at that stage I was like, okay, well, I mean, I need a, a chassis and I need suspension and I need to test it and get it out there and make sure it works right. Um, and see what's reasonable in terms of trying to make it more cost effectively, I guess I would say, um, you know, looking at different types of stainless steel and different types of coating type two anodizing, you know, and trying to find a way that things would work. And the reality is in this one world of building the typhoon or something capable of doing what it does, titanium is your answer and your only answer. I think people forget um, yeah. that when they see this video, it's not, uh, they're not on freshwater. This is saltwater where we all take yeah. razors off to the beach or something. And it's like an instant rush yeah, to yeah. the hose to wash off all the salt. And you know, oh, yeah. and you, you never get it all. And so it's, everything's always rusting, but for, for yeah. what you're doing, like you were saying, like most of it is all custom, right? Like there's very few factory parts on this car or you, you, there's hey, zero factory parts. but, uh, yeah, yeah, but zero it's, you got to think salt water yeah. is so corrosive and, mm. and, um, uh, aggressive to motorsports that it takes a completely different mindset than just bolting a car yeah. together. Well, and that's the scary thing. You know, if, uh, if you're selling somebody this vehicle that they see go around a turn at 90 miles an hour and they decide they're going to go do that with their child, uh, you know, it's not something that I'm willing to take any amount of money for or even willing to jeopardize to have them come around and, you know, have the thing fall apart on them. You know, because let's face it, I mean, people don't follow every guideline they should, traditionally speaking, in terms of maintaining their motorsports vehicles. It's more or less, you know, you do, and then it gets a little bit older and you're like, oh, hell with it, I'm getting a new one anyhow, move on to the next. Um, you know, when you're doing 90 miles an hour across the water, that's not a, a, an acceptable mindset. And so, um, you know, the reality is both in terms of weight savings and corrosion resistance, uh, because, you know, at the molecular level, it doesn't react uh, to salt the same way that other metals do, just the same as aluminum, uh, you know, because it's a four-way rather than a six-way bond. Um, and so, you know, I tried to think of every material under the sun that could be used to make the thing, and whether it's engineering tolerances or other things, um, there's just no way to make one from anything else. And even if you're driving around on lakes, it makes no difference. I mean. Um, water gets in there, even fresh water in any of these parts, and it's bad news. Um, so you said titanium. So, what yeah. parts of the vehicle are titanium, and which ones are maybe aluminum or or what? Plastic or whatever. Uh, so it's a hundred percent titanium. That's not a razor cage. The suspension's a hundred percent titanium. It's all custom angles. Um, literally every last piece of metal on there. Aside from, uh, you'll see some aluminum in, in part of the suspension components. Um, you know, that's milled aluminum. It's, you know, plenty strong. It's, you know, super thick and it's not welded to anything else. And that's really the only place that we use aluminum. Um, the way that the system is set up, I mean, you know, I, I know a lot of the world has seen the original patent drawings. Um, you know, I, I've since got on to have quite a few of them and put them in various entities. And, you know, frankly, I don't think anybody would even know what the hell the part was meant for if they saw it right. um, until you actually see, you know, the typhoon and start staring at the suspension and what's happening. Almost like but, in person, uh, you'd have to actually be able to appreciate it in person to understand all the little knickknacks yeah. and components and adapters and knuckles and all that stuff. Yeah. So, I, you know, one of the things that, you know, I guess is important to know from the start is, you know, the hulls are custom hulls and they're longer than a traditional hull. Um, secondarily, the razor is great for jumping because it's a triangle and that's the strongest shape in the world. So, you know, you take that and you take the two strongest points of a hull that is, you know, your beam, uh, you know, your bow and uh, your stern. So uh, the jet drive and up front in the ski are essentially the two places that you've got the most strength. And so what happens is um, when guys are out racing, wave runners or whatnot, uh, the chop against the bottom of the ski cracks the holes and it's actually fairly common. Um, uh, you know, I, most racers end up swapping their hulls out for that reason. So even the factory race teams aren't using factory hulls. Are they, so all, with that are they mind, all titanium or is that just like a different plexiglass oh, or no. fiberglass or what are they doing? Yeah, it's, it's, it's different fiberglass. Um, you know, it's made a little bit differently, uh, different laminating schedules, a little bit different design, uh, a little bit longer, a little bit more support in the center of the, the hull. 
um, you know, the stuff that we build, it's got, you know, a crazy amount of aluminum work and odd shapes that essentially force all of the force as it lands in the ocean or goes over chop up through the suspension and into the cage. And so uh, the cage is critical because you don't want the frame collapsing on itself. So the so, so the, the the actual protective cage and the chassis and the suspension and and the whole uh, supports are all working together to become one unified yeah. system that can distribute the impacts and the weight and the stress yep. evenly over the entire yep. structure, not necessarily at one point where like you know on a, when we're out right riding razors or, or off-road vehicles or whatever we a lot of times we think about the ball joint is kind of like that weak point right yep. like all the stress is going to yep. the ball joint um and there's some yep. other manufacturers working on solutions for that but basically you know when you're off-road your chassis and your in your frame and everything is basically just a container for you all the stress is being relayed through the suspension and and Correct. it doesn't travel from there up to the car until you've bottomed out Right. Uh, where right. you're saying yep. like the the varied terrain. I mean, when you're going that fast on water and hitting waves, it's almost like hitting concrete. Right. Like it's got to be able it to is, hit yeah. those forces and be able to yeah. withstand those pressures and those high velocities uh, a lot different than an yeah. off road car where even your tires are part of your suspension. Right. So. Yeah, um, absolutely. So what you're saying is that, you know, you had to engineer this from a, from the very bottom skim all the way up to the very top to be one component to take all the stress at all the angles. Yeah. Yep. After knowing exactly just how much force was going to be put on those things, yes, uh, Heim joints would snap in a second. Um, you know, if you're coming around a corner at 90 miles an hour, again, there's a ton of force between the front and the back of the hull. The other thing you have to remember is, you know, your suspension isn't traveling in a, you know, in a straight line that is uh, an equidistant space on either side, right? It's, you know, the rear suspension moves in a U and the front and rear tires of the vehicle actually move separately, right? And so... Right, completely independent um, suspension system versus yeah. this where it's all almost, you know, the left and right side are tied together, which then, I mean, I, I didn't even think about that until you said that, like just the the ge the geometry and and the impacts and the and the physics of like bouncing back and forth and how they have to work together and not yep. work together i mean yep. not working together is a very important part of of that concept like does does it have sway bars yeah uh, it does have, yeah it absolutely has sway bars yep. yeah so uh, like how does that is how one part that i would say we, that's one of the so that's all i box stuff that's the pretty much one of the very few things we don't make um and that's just cuz you know, I trust Ibok and I knew I was getting something good and, you know, I trust them more than myself to, you know, you didn't engineer your own that. shock bodies and valving. I'm like, I'm throwing this right. whole thing out the window now. I mean, well, you know, we did go to <laughs> shock therapy, so we kind of did actually do that. <laughs> so yeah, we went through the whole 200 pounds, spring on top 300 to the bottom and the rear. And then, you know, basically deducting hundred pounds from that later on. And, uh, but yep, we did all that valving and changing it. And, you know, part of it is that, uh, when you think about it, I mean, um, the suspension is kind of upside down, right? Because think about the weight of those skis. So that's why we've got the limiting straps because they're hanging down, but you know, the suspension is almost, almost working in an upside down fashion, uh, more so in a right side up fashion. I don't know if that Explain makes sense. Explain that a little bit. Like, so uh, a shock when it's upside right being that it's waiting for the compression to arrive. And then you're saying that it's different. Uh, correct. Cause this is the cage coming down at it. So instead of bouncing up, uh, you know, you've got all of the weight on the bottom. So it'd be like having, uh, well, you know, that's it. The, the cage up top is, uh, without the shocks on it, only 138 pounds, so, but that is the cage, the roof, the doors, everything. So, so the so, entire uh, quote unquote razor component of this vehicle yeah. is under 200 pounds. Yeah, it's, not, it's not at all a razor. Yeah. It's made by race tech titanium. And, uh, you know, kind of where we disappeared was not flipping over or anything like that. It was actually building jigs and setting up the manufacturing processes to be able to put these out with a level of quality that we wanted to, um, with the ability to get certified by the National Marine Manufacturers Association to follow all the American Boat and Yacht Building Council uh, guidelines, Coast Guard guidelines. There's definitely a lot to it, <laughs> but... Uh, so, yeah. so let's touch a little bit on, um, where, where, at, cause I want to get back to the manufacturing and all yeah. that. I think that's super interesting. 
But at some point, this became from, you know, a napkin sketch to, you yeah. know, reality. And, and you went through that whole development process with all your friends and contacts that you know. And then at yeah. some point in that time frame, it turned into, well, this is not just for me anymore. I want this to be bigger than what it what it was on the napkin, so to speak. How what, At what point did that become more of like, if I'm going to do this, I want to go big and make this an actual real thing for the world? Um. Well, I think they're two different things. Cause for me, like I, if I'm going to do it, I want to go big and that's it is you know, my attitude towards everything, um, with the vehicle sort of making that transition. Um, you know, it was kind of strange because I hit this point where I had done so much. No, 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 this isn't done right. That's not done right. We've got to do this to make it better. Um, and then we finally, finally hit this point where everything was working exactly as it should. Um, and we had a vehicle that was capable of some pretty amazing stuff as you've probably seen from the videos but uh lo and behold um you know one of the girls that works in one of my other offices is always big in social media and i kind of tell her you know it's not really a place to sell things it's a place to interact with an audience you know and, and so that's different than us marketing in other places that we market for our other businesses but uh you know she had always sort of mentioned TikTok to me and so you know, I kept hearing things on the news about TikTok and I'm thinking, okay, you're shitting me. This many people care about dancing. And, you know, I guess the good <laughs> thing is I can get on there and make an account and I'm sure as hell not dancing on there. And, uh, you know, I'll be able to just snoop around and at least see what it is or why somebody would like it better right. than Instagram or whatever. So, uh, in October, you know, I decided to put up a profile and I put up, uh, you know, a picture and then, you know, started playing around with just trying to make sure it was a complete profile. And I want to say maybe a half hour had passed. And, uh, you know, one of my chief fabricators, Mike, uh, who's, you know, the bald headed guy that you see in the videos a lot, uh, ends up calling me and he says, you know, that was a pretty awesome video you put up online. And I'm like, what the hell are you doing on TikTok, dude? I mean, <laughs> you're, I mean, you're not a teenage 40s, girl. What man. are you doing? Right. Yeah, exactly. That's exactly it. And he's like, uh, I didn't see it on TikTok. I saw it on Facebook. And I'm like, well, I don't have a Facebook page for us yet. And I don't even use Facebook. And he's like, well, somebody shared it. Well, and the I'm internet like, does. Okay. And, <laughs> well, yeah, exactly. And so the ironic part is at that point, I'm still thinking like, shit, all right, which one of your friends like was connected to you, therefore saw this thing, you know, and I'm like, all right, man, just call your buddy or call whoever has the post and just ask them to, you know, maybe keep it under wraps or keep it low key. And, you know, then I get a ha 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 message back. <laughs> and then a picture of Facebook and there's 13 million views on it. Um, and I remember waking up the next morning and on TikTok, it was like, congratulations on your first post. You have 179,000 likes. <laughs> like, okay, <laughs> this is awkward. <laughs> I don't know what to do about this. But, uh, you know, it just didn't stop. And so, uh, you know, you and I had probably spoken pretty early on. Yeah. But, um, you know, it was one of those things where, you know, I put it up and within, you know, maybe four weeks, I had had 100 people at least ask me to do different shows and things. And so, um, you know, sort of the ironic part, uh, and even now, I guess the thing that I've always done is just the people that were really polite and understood, you know, building this stuff isn't just like party time. There's a lot of effort and energy that goes into it. And, right. you know, as soon as I can make time, I'm, I'm on it. I, you know, if I say I'm going to do something, I do it. It may not happen exactly when I hope it's going to happen, but you know, I, I make it happen sooner or later. But, uh, you know, we got asked to do all kinds of TV shows and, uh, everything under the sun. And so we kind of blitz through some of that. And, you know, as it was happening, um, you know, I didn't even realize there were mailboxes or whatever. I mean, I just thought it was, you know, talking back and forth in the comments. So I even set up an Instagram page and, you know, now this thing's blowing up. And, you know, I want to say by, uh, you know, the end of the year, which, you know, is really only a couple of months. I mean, Instagram probably had 30,000 plus followers. You know, TikTok had 100,000 plus followers. Um, and we're hitting 100,000 followers and I'm finding out that there's like DMs in TikTok. <laughs> uh, and that there even are on Instagram. I had no clue that those things existed. So uh, I went because I'm, you know, I'm like, all right, this is my chill time. I'm going to go to Mexico, relax for a little bit. And I made myself a margarita, whatever. And then 
I, I for whatever reason clicked on the activity button and I'm like, oh shit, there's other things you can look at in here. <laughs> and there's just bazillions of messages and I'm like, shit, dude. And like I look through and I'm like, okay, let me sort by blue check marks, I guess. Like that seems like the best way to try to figure it out. And so I do, and uh, there is everybody on the sun in there, like clowning and like sending me void like video messages, like what the fuck, dude? You know, do you think I'm not who I say I am? Look at where the account's from. Like, I don't normally use this account. I have someone who uses it for me. Right. But here's a picture of me right now, just to verify to you, so you respond. Like, dude, I'm not trying to ignore you. I just had no idea this shit was even there. <laughs> I'm, I'm just sorry, old guy everybody. In the Bahamas drinking my margarita. Yeah, I don't dude, know what this is. Totally, dude. I'm trying to chill and I'm like getting treated like I'm um, Hitler or something. Like, what the fuck, dude? Like, give me a break, man. I, I'll take a day and try to respond. And then I realized like that would be probably like several years of responding to get through all of them. Well, I think that, uh, you know, since we're such a social media culture now, you know, when something so unique and so different and disruptive is kind of like shown off, um, yeah. you know, the assumption is that that was the goal from the beginning was to get the likes, to get the yep. shares, to get the the virality of it, right? And, you know, social media wasn't even in your mindset when you started this whole project. Not it was it was a it was a passion pursuit. It was this this thing, this objective of uh, accomplishment that you were going after. It had no nothing to do with, you know, knowing that, you know, a hundred thousand uh Germans and Asians and Australians were going to be yeah. sharing this thing, right? So it yeah. it uh, is it, our culture just assumes those those things from the very beginning, and when when they don't play out in our heads the way we assume and are used to seeing them play out, you know, people can get kind of salty, and uh, and so I'm sure you had yeah. to deal with a lot of that, um, and especially with the backlog that you then had to search through, and I'm sure there was a point where you just like just said, okay, well that's too old for me to even consider talking to, but you know, at some point, you know, you start responding and people are like, Oh, you, you know, why, why now? Why did you put me off? Why do I not, you know, why is my value so low that it took you three months to talk to me? But I, people just don't understand well, that uh, not everybody uses social media. <laughs> you, know, you know, who helped me out was actually the C boys. <laughs> I, I was going to bring them up. Are. So you started working with oh. a couple different, you know, social media people started showing up and, and just checking your stuff out. Kind people. People that were good dudes that just, like I said, you know, understood that I might not be able to do stuff right away, but like as soon as I can, I will. Um, you know, and you know, those guys were like, "Hey, you know, when do you think you can do this?" And I'm like, "Well, I don't know." Like they're like, well, "When could we call you back to find out when a better time is?" And they were so kind of you know polite and professional about it. I was like, "All right, call me back on December first. Call me back on January first. Um, the day we filmed, I called them at midnight." or maybe like 11 p.m. and said, you know, can you guys come out and film tomorrow? And they're like, yeah. And at that point, I have no idea that they're coming from like Minnesota. <laughs> I was going to say, they're, they're nowhere near Florida. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, they were nowhere near Florida. And they actually did show up and were there on time and ready to go. Yeah, but, those, uh, are a, those are a cool group of kids. I mean, they're not kids anymore. They're all adults now. But I, yeah. I met them when they were just starting off their channel and everything back in... I went to Heydays up in Minnesota, met them. And and yeah. uh, I think they were doing their first like big giveaway or whatever. And um, we shared it for them and all that stuff. And, and I remember just, you know, they're... they're, they're their personalities were all about, we're just having fun. We're just a bunch of friends yeah, that exactly. just want to do cool stuff and, and bring people along for the ride. And, uh, so it's interesting that, you know, you know, that they've gotten to a place of success to where they can now just jump on a plane yeah. and, and fly down and do stuff with cool people. Um, so I think that's super cool, but, um, you know, how did they kind of realign you with social media? How did that help you out? Well, you know, the beautiful thing about it was, uh, I do this, you know, filming with them and get finished up and then they do their podcast and uh, the fortunate thing is it kind of spread like wildfire because in their podcast they're like you know you would think this guy is just out there like hustling for looks and trying to get everybody's attention he has no fucking clue what's going on and could care less <laughs> frankly even more like he turned us down to go to dinner so <laughs> you know I, I, he's just you know he's not really hip to the social media world and you know, he genuinely does not have any clue that you're trying to contact him or whatever. Maybe try again now that they've got a little more in place, but like he is legitimately being honest about having no idea that you sent a message. So world, like chill off. This guy's tried his hardest to respond to your comments, but like he's killing himself. And it's kind of funny because 
they're like, dude, the comments are what you should ignore. Right. <laughs> you should have been responding to the DMs. I'm like, okay, whatever, <laughs> fair enough. But, um, you know, I, I guess I kind of realized at that point through them, they were like, you know, well, it, at the end of the day, social media, you know, like our, our primary thing is YouTube. But, you know, the good news about social media is you can meet anybody you want. I'm like, what do you mean? They're like, we're riding around in a Razor on two jet skis with you right now because of social media. Um, right. You know, and then I kind of had this epiphany. I'm like, well, shit. I wonder who I can get a hold of, uh, which included, you know, uh, other musicians and things, CEOs of other companies, um, you know, aligning with Riva and getting a hold of Dave online. Um, you know, I had a, a bunch of mutual contacts, but I was just like, you know, how with it? You know, I'd rather connect on a personal level. Right. If he's interested in talking to me about any of this stuff, he'll respond. And if he's not, he'll go his own separate way. But, um, you know, uh, I end up reaching out to sort of them, Race Tech, who I had, you know, purchased a lot of material from, but hadn't really aligned with in any sort of professional business way. Um, you know, the other thing that kind of happened at that point is um, I remember us all kind of talking, you know, about whether or not we were going to produce and sell these. And, you know, we figured, well, maybe we'll, we'll build a couple more of them and see what happens. And, uh, you know, I think the Sea Boys were like, dude, like that's the most dick thing in the world to invent this. And like, it's the most amazing thing ever <laughs> and you own patents. So no one else can make one, right? but you're the only dude who has one. What is the point of that? I'm like, oh, I don't know. Uh, it's a Florida thing. Don't worry about it. Kept, yeah, I don't know. People <laughs> just kept telling me to get patents for shit. So I was like, okay, why not? And you know, a lot of people were like, well, before you go ahead and build a titanium caged, whatever, like it might be a smart idea to, to protect the work that you're going to put into that. It's but, funny um, that uh, I used to work for uh, a company that was owned by Polaris. And I remember yeah. there being an email that went out said, you know, hey, you know, just as a company culture thing, if you have any ideas that you think would be super cool for our company to look into, this is a way for you to kind of voice your your thoughts and your ideas and whatever. Sure. And two things that I brought up that um, were quickly ignored were one, uh, you know, creating overland content that did these cool adventures with the products. Right. And that got yep. blown off and then that blew up. Like now that's a huge thing. Yeah, right. right? <laughs> and then, yep. and then the second thing was, where are we not doing these cool things? It's on the water. Right. Yeah. And I was like, yeah. we need a razor on the, this is in 2019 before I even started this like adventure of starting this whole <laughs> thing. And I was like, we need to yeah. figure out how to put a razor on the water, whatever that looks like. Like it may look like an alien craft of some sort, but doing what we do on dirt on water would be amazing. And then shortly after that, the mini boat thing took off. Right. And these guys were oh, jumping yeah, these yeah. mini boats yeah. off of sandbars and stuff. And then, you know, a couple of years yeah. later, I mean, by this point, you're already in this, like mentally, you're already designing yeah. this in your head. And then a couple of oh, yeah. 2019, I had one. So, <laughs> so and I had no clue. Sucked, right. But, and, and so yeah. we went looking online. What What's out there? We saw these like convertible things where the tires went up into the hole and like all these different yeah. things. Um, yeah. But uh, but it was just funny how like these good ideas exist. Yeah. It's just about who's going to make them happen. And so, you know, that's why I was super stoked to talk to you about like what what's the history sure. behind us? How did this come to be? Because I think people yeah. have good ideas and they're so scared to even like invest an hour of their time into researching it or making it more than an idea. And just like this yeah. podcast was like, I always wanted to start a podcast. And then my buddy Ian was like, well, why don't we start? And it was like, well, why don't yeah. we start? Well, I don't have mics. Well, I'll buy the mics. Well, okay. Then we started, right? It was like, yeah. you know, it just takes a little bit of motivation. And, and I think a lot of times we have to see somebody else and, and understand yeah. that it was purely an idea that came to fruition out of passion, not out of like this motivated, like corporate culture thing. That's absolutely true. Um, and you know, that was the cool part about the project is as it progressed, everybody, you know, to, to hear somebody talk about it as one thing to end up seeing it as another thing to see it in person is another thing to actually see it driving is a whole other thing. But, um, you know, I guess, you know, that, that, uh, transition is kind of, brought more and more people our way and wanting to help. So, you know, where it might be impossible for me to work with certain companies, um, you know, I've been able to sort of jump in very quickly with the biggest and the best because they see this thing and they're like, okay, like you figured out all the hard shit. Now it's not a, a bad idea anymore. So we're happy to make it happen with you. And um, that's been one of the crazy parts, the, the huge companies that, you know, and it's not because they do explain to me they, I've been in, I've had it explained to me a number of times why they turn it down. 
Uh, and I get it, you know, if, if you're backlogged on, you know, speedometers on wave runners that are sitting out in the field behind a dealership, you know, because you're waiting on parts. Yeah, it's probably not a good idea to take a risk in the business, especially when you're now moving to a price point that's well above anything else you make. Right. Um, you know, even jet boats for that matter. So, um, you know, for me, I kind of realized nobody else was going to do it. And, um, you know, again, for me, it was one of those things where like, I, you know, like you said, I, I, I need to experience a Polaris Razor on the water because uh, it's unlike all the other riding places. They never shut down the ocean. You can always ride there. You know, they don't get rid of any part of the ocean. <laughs> Only in Dubai do they build shit in the middle of the ocean. <laughs> so there are now houses in the middle of it. But uh, they don't seem to mind anyhow. They're still willing to buy them. But, um, you know, it, the cool part about it is the ocean is always changing. And, you know, now you can get out there and, you know, every day is something new, right? So if you're wanting to hit the waves, that's one thing that's fun to do. If you're wanting to go on the river and cruise through swamp grass or tight spaces, that's another thing that's a blast to do. But, uh, you know, it's, it's essentially built to be the trophy truck of the ocean. Um, it can be used in fresh water, but the intent is perfectly smooth suspension, being able to slam right over a 10 foot wave land, no problem. Um, you know, and that's progressed into us talking about, you know, racing teams someday and, and other things. And, um, I hadn't even thought about that doing like short course water racing with these would be amazing. Uh, you know, my thought was, uh, Bimini 500 come from the Jupiter inlet, have some fuel boats back and forth. That'd be awesome. And run it across to the Bimini islands up and down and come back. So, uh, we'll see. I'm trying to talk some of the initial <laughs> owners of the vehicles to either lend their vehicles to racers or, or participate in some way. But, you know, I guess just like, you know, waiting patiently and, and, you know, not quitting, uh, you know, brought the typhoon to the world, you know, maybe the same thing will happen again. Yeah. I was uh, just envisioning like, you know how like Red Bull has their, their plane races over the water with the, with the, yep. the pylons. Yep the pylons like yep. that's kind of where i was like it'd be super cool just to, it'd be a good like visual thing people could crown around a, gro- a cove and like watch these guys maybe even put some yep. jumps out in the middle of it it would be pretty awesome to see like this yep. like super cross thing out in the water um you know I, we'll see what happens but red bull had approached me uh, about doing some pretty cool stuff that uh you know, they just uh, you know I, I guess at this point only wondered whether or not i'd be willing to do it right but um you know, I guess they're similarly thinking of a short course out in the water, you know, prior to a major race and, you know, letting people just sort of see this thing for the first time, which, um, you know, for me, that honestly is the profit. People ask about why you start, you know, why'd you start building a manufacturing business, you know, at this point. And, you know, the thing is the number of people that I'm with that you seemingly have everything, but, you know, the ability to smile and be happy, right. have that eliminated pretty much immediately you know you hop behind a steering wheel i don't care how big of a dick you are you're gonna have a giant smile glued to your face right um you know and nothing drives like it it's it's an an insane experience and you know if you're ever here in south florida i highly recommend stopping by (laughs) so explain a little bit the steering and driving experience because that's not because i mean we have to get past this whole like it looks like a razor thing right it doesn't it's, right. It doesn't drive like a, an automobile. It doesn't have a gas pedal and a brake and a, and a normal steering Correct. wheel, right? It's a completely different experience. Explain that a little bit. So uh, it has a gas uh, throttle. Well, it has a throttle, and then it's got a, a brake and reverse level uh, lever. And so uh, the way the reverse system works is it's got uh, reverse jet thrust uh, nozzles, and essentially they come down over the nozzles and focus the thrust forward. And that allows you to go in reverse, kind of crab walk it in different directions. But um, oddly, that gives it a lot of maneuverability, you know, when you've got the two hulls tied together the way they are with our system. Um, And so, you know, I can basically maneuver right in between of anything or parallel park in between two boats or, you know, and not like a wave runner sort of bouncing around. I can come in dead steady sideways. Um, The next thing is, uh, you know, I, I guess, um, throttle pretty straightforward. You grab the throttle, you pull it, and uh, what everybody describes it as is the feeling of being in like a thousand horsepower dune buggy coming across the dunes 
and you're waiting for that moment like where it comes down from the wheelie and kind of starts slowing down and dying down <laughs> but it just never stops going it just keeps going and going and going and going and you can see out the windshield the whole time right. <laughs> or out the you know the window opening so but, uh, what's the powertrain under there i mean you mentioned it earlier but explain a little bit what's underneath it yeah. so it's powered by two yamaha gp 1800r sbho engines um we strip them out of uh essentially gp 1800 wave runners right out of the box so they're never put in the water never anything done to them we take them dry rip everything out of them component wise and then we start building uh the hulls and uh in that process we end up changing a, a fair amount of uh what's involved in the motor work i mean the bulk of our buyers want that you know rip your head off performance right. um you know they may not use it but you know the thing is it's still cool to be able to pump the throttle and have it jump out of the water you know right. four or five feet you know and, and it wows people because you hit you know the water again and it it doesn't bounce or slam or throw you around right so uh it's a lot more forgiving with passengers and whatnot um you know the brake the great thing about it is uh you'll see in the videos i mean our, our test lake behind the the shop is not huge but um i can get up to 80 miles an hour and and back down uh, in a very short space um and a lot of people don't like bike. in the off-road world that don't do a lot of water sports yeah. like going 80 miles an hour on water is not the <laughs> same thing as going on 80 miles an hour no. on the dirt no not at all um Although I've asked every big guy and, uh, you know, in the side by side world, you know, would it be cool to, to have a lineup in the water of like the typhoon next to a razor? And they're like, no, that would be the dumbest thing ever. Like you would be at the other end of the lake by the time we made it halfway, just right. based on how fast you're getting to those speeds. But, you know, unless somebody was to put, you know, a thousand horsepower, you know, razor with, uh, you know, extended uh you know rear swing arms or whatever extended chassis or a full-on race or whatever. Like it's, yeah like it's not going to be a race and the thing is even that then when you you know if you were to compare turning or things like that it's again not the same thing um you know so that the experience i mean uh it's pretty similar to driving a side by side in the dunes i mean reverse works just like a boat so it's reversed but uh you know in time in terms of typical driving it's in my opinion less learning curve than a wave runner um you know and the the other part about it is it's a, a really crazy machine because it's you know you try to push it and find the limits and it just doesn't really have any limits so if you want to turn at 90 miles an hour you can do it and it feels like going to space camp but <laughs> you know you're not going to get thrown out the window and you know you're not going to roll over and none of those things are going to happen um, so do you, you know, wear so that, a full on harness and everything inside this vehicle or is it a different approach to safety? No. Oh no. Uh, well, so my approach to safety is simple. Uh, as far as being out on the water, I mean, I'll get into some pretty crazy surf. A lot of like, some things we don't post, uh, or whatnot. I mean, if we're doing some crazy shit, but, uh, you know, if I am, I've got, uh, an inflatable life vest on. And so if it were to roll over or anything like that, I mean, A, that means uh, I'm on a wave that is over 13 feet tall and has over a 91% uh, break angle. So uh, basically, I did it to myself if that were to happen. <laughs> but, uh, you know, essentially, it's going to inflate and pull me right out the side and out I come. Um, so, you know, the idea of being strapped in, um, you know, I don't know. I just, in my opinion and the coast guard's opinion and everybody else's it's just better to if it were to happen you know float on out and call it a day i mean reaching around and hoping that you get a you know a, a, i forget what they call them the um the little regulators the buddy bottles i guess right that they put in offshore race boats you know my opinion is that's just too much to think about um you know originally you could be halfway you know, to the surface by the time you got that thing working yeah, exactly. I mean, you're going to be floating on the surface by the time you find it. Um, and the thing is, it's got its own system, so it takes care of itself. As soon as you hit the water, it's shutting off. Um, however, the bilges and everything inside of it still work. They're upside down bilges, so it's not going under. It wouldn't anyhow because um, we have basically 12 square feet uh, or 12, qu 12 cubic feet of two pound flotation material built into the halls. So uh, there is no sinking. I know a lot of people <laughs> on social media world are hoping that flipping and sinking happen, but 
you know, what's I guess the, my uh, biggest cent- question. I was going to say, what's the center of yeah. gravity like with that? Because you have all the flotation and all the weight at the bottom, right? But you're putting this yep. massive, like, you, I know it's un- under 200 pounds, the structure of it, but you're also putting yep. in, you know, 200 to 500 pounds worth of people in it. Like, how does that affect yep. the safety and the flotation and the rotation and all that? Well, remember, we have twice the haul and the total weight. So we're only putting two people in and one ski already has the capacity to hold 500 pounds, no problem. Um, start adding in a whole bunch of other physics and that other ski is going to distribute some of the capacity of, of weight. And so we say, you know, the weight capacity is 500 pounds plus 30 pounds of cargo. Um, you could probably load it up with a hell of a lot more, but you know, safely and just making life easy for the coast guard and liability reasons. Right. You know, we say 500 pounds, but, um, you know, if you think about it, you've got call it all the suspension and everything pushing, you know, 400 and change with all the suspension components, all of the mounts and everything outside of the skis, that's still less than two other riders on the other ski. Right. So, um, you're always kind of, at this point of, you know, a little less than two riders on a ski. However, the skis uh, all have intercoolers on them, different impellers, different intake grates, different ride plates, and all of that comes from Reva Racing. So um, as I kind of lost track of what I was saying before, you know, as we basically take apart this first ski or take apart the donor ski, we're then going to, you know, a blank hall, you know, putting on Reva Sponsons um, and decking the thing out. So you know, does it need it to push it? Certainly not. But again, that's typically the way things are done just because, um, you know, at least at this point in time, it's not their first, you know, the buyers are not experiencing their first big boy purchase, you know, and right. I think anybody who decides their first $250,000 should go to a side by side on the water is insane. <laughs> now, if you've got a couple toys, if you've got a mega yacht, if $250,000, is essentially what it costs to fill your boat up with gas. Now we're talking differently. Right. Um, you know, and that's, that's the part that kind of caught me by surprise. And I hadn't thought about was, uh, yacht owners and people that are doing yacht charters. So, you know, and kind of talking with them and thinking through it, I'm like, holy shit, you guys are right. By having these things sit on the front of your yachts, they're going to be rented out every oh, yeah. day for the next foreseeable future. And when you think about Frankly, the transport getting, from yeah. yacht to land and all that kind of stuff that goes on yeah. typically in that scenario, you know, being able to just yeah. step into a vehicle like experience and yeah. just drive back and forth is, is kind of a new concept. Do it fully clothed. And, you know, I mean, it's, it's, like I said, it's, it's definitely significantly different than a boat. Um, you know, it attacks the wave differently, even coming down from a wave, it's entirely different. You don't have that bow on the front, you know, constantly bouncing up and down. So yeah, you can get off of your yacht, wear whatever you're wearing and drive right up through shallow water that, you know, even boats can't get through. I mean, for us, you know, we can get into eight inches of water pretty reasonably. Um, you know, depending how fast you're going, you can get in even more shallow water if you know the right. waterways and where you're traveling. So, uh, and there are times that, you know, that we do that, but I mean, it's keeping it on the throttle and, <laughs> you know, I guess in my experience, only once have I ever, uh, had the thing where one of the skis ended up touching the, the, uh, touching underneath the vehicle. And of course it was in like gator infested water with a thousand <laughs> gators. <laughs> and the funny part is I'm like, thank goodness I'm on this. Cause then there's a bunch of dudes on jet skis that are like, fuck it. I just want to yeah. see that thing closer. I'll jump in the water. <laughs> oh my God. But, uh, you know, as soon as I hopped out and took my weight out of it, it popped right up and, you know, back off on my way. I was, but, wow. um, so you mentioned yeah. building these for other people, um, up to this point, yeah. uh, there's the original, the original one. And then I think you built one for SEMA or for something like that is, are you Correct. up to two or are you more than two now? Uh, so there are several in production, uh, we're up to two now, uh, in working vehicles that we use. Um, the one that you see for SEMA is essentially number one, that's getting sold. Um, I was going to keep that for myself. And I guess part of the good thing of aligning with, uh, Riva and, um, you know, and with race tech titanium is that they kind of looked at me sideways, like, okay, you're the first manufacturer in the world that doesn't want to sell anything you make. But like, yeah, because I make cool shit that nobody else makes, so I'm making it for me. That's why I want it. But uh, it appears that one is not going to be staying with me very long. Uh, so, 
That's was it one of those like money, money talk situations where it was like, oh, that's for me. And then someone was like, hey, I'll make it worth your while. <laughs> no, that happened a ton in the beginning. And the thing is, like what I would do with the money is buy another one of these. That's kind of why I did it in the first place. <laughs> right. You know, I could have bought a Ferrari or Lamborghini or a Bugatti or, you know, Lamborghini boat, but that's still nothing like what I ended up ultimately putting together or what I wanted for myself. You know, I wanted something where me or one other person get out there and like have your riding day. Um, you know, unfortunately in the ocean or in the water environments that we're running in and with the tolerances and the amount of force on it, it has to be titanium and so it cost as much as a lamborghini in the first place but um you know for the right buyer or for myself even i mean i don't have to think twice about what i would rather have it's a hell of a lot more fun than sports cars so let's uh venture a little away from that so you've built this company that manufactures these unique yeah. vehicles and now you've got yeah. a handful of other unique vehicles that you've built, including like a single seater, little boat jet ski thingy, <laughs> like that <It> was super, <laughs> super cool. And then, you know, I saw, I saw what looked like a Corvette on the water, but what, 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 el- what other vehicles are you guys investing in? Uh, so a lot of these things are just, uh, well, the Corvette in particular, that thing is a, I don't know. Uh, no comment. That's not the, we did not make that haul. That's okay. actually made in Egypt or Turkey or something. Um, they call them jet cars and that's becoming a big thing. They wanted to work with us very heavily. And, you know, I've been approached by several people and I just kind of thought, you know, like I'm not using my, uh, like man, manuf- manufacturer's identification, what they use for the Marine world, right? you know, on something that does not even come close to meeting all the standards that it has to. So, you know, if somebody has one and they want it to be race only, or they have a private lake, you know, fantastic. But, uh, that was a complete nightmare for our fiberglass guys to go in and actually turn it into a working running vehicle. Um, but, uh, there's still quite a few other things where, you know, I just get ideas in my head and decide we're going to build something. And, um you know now that we're moving heavily into manufacturing you know i'm having even the guys working with me like can we please like have a break like what the hell man like you seriously have an idea every two days right. and then we end up making it you know and then people wanting to buy them and you know more or less you're probably gonna just piss people off because they want to buy all the shit right. but uh you know and, and i mean the good stuff is coming but <laughs> uh we did a tank uh segway nine bot i don't know if you ever saw that I saw, I've seen but, a handful of Ninebot stuff you've been doing, including some tracks and stuff. Is Do you have a full-on yeah. tank version? Uh, so what we're going to do is a full kit for it, yep, yeah, where you'll be able to convert a, a stock one over. And that's just the shipping cost of the of the Ninebot itself. You know, by the time you send it, or I have it sent to me, and then I ship it to somebody, you know, you're going to add 800 bucks to the price. Right. You know, converting it isn't that tough, so... <laughs> you know, we'll see. Uh, I don't want to spread myself in too many places, but uh, we're also in the process of taking the sit down ski that you saw, um, which actually, uh, I, you, I don't know if you saw it on the Seaboys. That's yet another thing. Yeah, um, I saw That's where I saw it was on yeah. that episode of them uh, driving it. So that was actually real when they turned around and were like, hey, would you sell this thing? And I'm like, I don't know. I never really think about selling some of these things. It's just cool shit that, you know, I keep around here as we build all the other things that actually are intended to sell. Right. But, uh, you know, have fun. If you want to go for ripping it, enjoy. And, you know, they turned around and they're like, I want it. Yeah. Like, okay. You know, so we negotiated very quickly and they're like, okay, like text me your routing number and all your shit right now. You'll have your money before the thing comes back to the, to the dock. I'm like, okay, well, all right, I guess. Being a YouTuber definitely is, <laughs> is better than I thought it was. Holy shit. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> They're not sitting too poorly yet. They must be doing better than I thought they were. Yeah. But, you know, so, uh, but, you know, now I'm working on an, uh, on an electric version of it. Um, and so 144 volts and uh, hoping to have it do some pretty cool shit. But, um, you know, we are going to finish up essentially that identical craft and then, you um, I'm going to take a titanium cage and surround it and build a, essentially a mini rip saw. So the goal is to have a rip saw should be able to do around 65, 70 on land, uh, maybe 40 or so in the water. So the rip saw for those that aren't initiated with it is kind of like uh, the yes. consumer version of a military tank where it's a fully tracked vehicle can, yeah. has a, I think yeah. a, 
is it a Duramax or something inside of it? And then it has it does yeah. uh, has a drivetrain in it that is constantly spinning, and then you control it by braking it or something like that. But uh, yeah, what you're talking true. about is making something that is a single v- for single person vehicle that's compact, fits in the back of your truck, can go anywhere, do anything, and and you're talking about making an electric version. Uh, yep, essentially. Well, so. I guess they're all electric, yep. right? Okay. You're just talking about bigger a bigger system. Uh, what do you mean, Ty? Uh, the, um, the 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 saw, little, no. the little ripsaw guy. Oh, uh, that's actually a wholly separate thing. I was talking about the actual legitimate full size ripsaws. Um, no, we're working on. Uh, I mean, it's about the length of a wave runner, so it's uh, I think nine feet overall length. You know, from front to back of the treads. And you know, 144 volts. So it's more something you would trailer around, um, but that will be able to transition from land to water seamlessly. And so it'll have a jet impeller, and then it's essentially just a wait, 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 wait. Hold on a second. I was thinking two vehicles here. You're talking about one vehicle. No, I'm talking about one vehicle. Okay, so this is going to be basically like a like that sit-in jet ski, but then it's going to have the ability to have tracks on it. Correct. Yep. Okay, well, you're blowing my mind right now, so I'm going to have to see some uh, see some drawings of this because I really want to see this thing. Code, I want to see it up here in the Northwest. <laughs> you know, I need to invite you on some of my calls with the other partners. Like, I got the guys from Race Tech and whatever, and, you know, like, I actually sketched out, like, three different designs for flying Yamaha Banshees. And, you know, at first they kind of thought I was kidding. Now they realize I'm dead serious about everything I talk about building. Uh, so they're like, please, nothing that flies, just hold off on this shit until we start delivering these things i mean you've got an awful lot of people who want them we're all super busy we're kind of like working you know at, a, at 110 miles an hour pace and you know flying stuff and tanks like <laughs> you already started the tank so that's your thing you can we'll keep on going with it but you know no more wonderful ideas until we finish this <laughs> <laughs> so what i'm envisioning is walking into your office and having like a willy wonka's version of like engineering and design the concepts and you know craziness happening yeah. absolutely uh and the crazy part about it is i get some of the smartest engineers i've ever met and they walk in here and they're walking around looking at stuff like holy shit like where did you get your engineering degree and I'm like nowhere youtube basically <laughs> <laughs> you know i heard what i didn't know and then i looked shit up and so sometimes i had to buy publications but you know most of the time it was on the internet free to learn or somebody did some sort of scientific explanation of whatever it was people uh were describing to me but yeah it's 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 very much that lots of remote control stuff uh lots of autonomous stuff i don't know i get these ridiculous ideas in my head and you know, people sort of think it's one of those things where it becomes months long projects, but uh, the stuff that people see us do, I mean, the reason we don't have a YouTube channel is because uh, it, it's not scripted stuff. So it's, we grab an RC car, we go out, we do one take with an iPhone, whatever the hell happened is whatever the hell happens. Either we got something or we didn't, you know, and it's usually at the end of the day when we're just like, okay, we're done. But, you know, before we wrap it up, okay, you know, let's blow up a white balloon with a remote control helicopter and... Yeah, you know, if we all laugh, then we're like, okay, it sounds like a good idea. So your one of your so, last posts was an RC helicopter shooting uh, Roman candles at at a balloon or something like that. Are, are we slowly yeah. uh, devolving into the Tony Stark of the modern age? You know, everybody says that, but uh, I guess if I have any, you know, autonomous vehicles that may or may not have weaponry or whatnot, <laughs> they're all personal or military use, and so I have no intention of selling anything like that uh but yeah we actually made a little cannon system for the tank which is quite <laughs> awesome but, um, just dropping one more thing as you we made, made a cannon system yeah. for our tank yeah yeah well so that's you know and everybody's like yeah okay um you if anybody because of the businesses you're in should know like you just weaponized a drone <laughs> i'm like yeah no but i mean it's not well yeah i guess technically speaking i did just sort of weaponize a drone. <laughs> but i'll only use it to hurt other toys <laughs> well i mean if it's a pota- potato cannon is that really a weapon i mean come on i mean you got a lot of velocity with a potato <laughs> cannon so <laughs> we, we it might be something to add to the true electric tank, which, you know, I guess that would be awesome. That'd shock the shit out of your friends if you <laughs> shot them with a potato. <laughs> oh, I've, I've put a hole straight through multiple inches of plywood with potato cannon, so I know that that's not a good yeah. idea. <laughs> What's the, uh, yeah. I've noticed you guys have been playing with hovercrafts. So is that something you're going to get into as well? Yeah, so, um, you know, the hovercraft thing started because, you know, my first 
Or was that just the recovery Russian vehicle headset. for the for the UAV? No. <laughs> No, no, not at all. Uh, the hovercraft was its own separate thing. You know, I kind of got this thing in my head one day where I was just like, whatever the heck, what happened to hovercrafts? You know what I mean? It, right. It's such a cool concept. And I've seen very cool iterations of hovercrafts, but why hasn't it caught on? And why hasn't somebody figured out a good way to sort of re-engineer it or reinvent it for 30 years later? Because all of the technology you're looking at is 30 years old on these things. Right. Um, you know, so for me, uh, you know, I wanted to put together a hovercraft where we could kind of play around and see if we could get around uh, some of the stability issues. So, you know, being able to not have to worry about sliding into something, um, you know, some of the little things that, you, you know, most people probably wouldn't think about because, you know, you get in a hovercraft that's 30 years old or even new ones, you begin to see all of the technological reasons why they kind of went out of favor with people. Um, but, you know, that the black one that we've shown on the, the internet is one that um, we've worked out a lot of kinks on and um, it's fallen into the category of even though lots of people want to buy them you know my business partners are like right but we already have a giant wait list of people for a very expensive vehicle right how, like how do you plan on making all this stuff happen all at once um so i guess that's kind of where things got left gotcha so when you're talking about like bringing that smile back to your face, right? Like yeah. you, the, this whole project started with this passion that, that came out of nowhere. It's kind of like when I discovered off-road in the first time in 2016, yeah. got in the razor, went and ripped with the family and realized that we all just had a blast that we would never have experienced yeah. without any, this type of vehicle. Um, now you're into the business side of it. You're into the logistics side of it. You're into expectations side of it. And um, how has that changed your perspective? Are you still having that same smile on your face you know, when you, when you start thinking about this and going to quote unquote work and, and, or test driving this thing, or, I mean, has, has your perspective changed well, at all? Uh, it depends which one of those scenarios you're talking about. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, the smile has been wiped off my face entirely from a business perspective and things are going great, but it's just way more shit to do it right than I ever thought. I mean, you know, training materials for technicians, uh owner's manuals you know all these different things are you know things that you could print on a piece of paper and technically get away with a minimum guidelines on but you know at a quarter million dollars you know at that point you kind of have to build the rest of a quarter million dollar vehicle you know so the the materials it's made from justify it but there's also that whole responsibly creating something and fully creating something that should be sold to the public and could be sold to the public and is safe to sell to the public um so you know in, in those regards it's probably you know I, I don't know that stuff has ever been all that fun um a lot of the rc stuff and toys and other <laughs> inventions are my form of making fun during the building stuff right uh because this is really complicated however every last time i get back in the typhoon and i'm driving it i'm like yep okay that's why we do this and that's why i'm willing to continue on with this and yep i would be a dick if i was the only person in the world to have one so here we go. I guess we're going to wake up and do this again tomorrow and have 10 jobs <laughs> that I don't need anyhow. <laughs> right. Cause I mean, so, you're still, yeah. you're still managing all this previous stuff, right? Like you still have all these right. medical centers and, and buildings, commercial yeah. spaces. You still have all that to yeah. work. And, and obviously, you know, delegation with employees and things like that happens, but yeah. that doesn't detract from the stress and the logistics of the mental space. We all have a mental yeah. capacity. Right. And that's something yeah. that I've really been trying to fine tune on my own is like, where is my mental capacity limits? Like, where do I become less efficient? Where do I come, you know, less um, dependable, yeah. things like that. Uh, I can only imagine that there's some sort of like just person's type, like physical type that works better in these situations than others. Uh, we've always talked, you know, the, the, the world talks about different personality sets and like, you know, you're an A type, B type, whatever. Um, sure. But, uh, but I'm assuming there's, a, there's gotta be something that you're doing to kind of keep it all together up here when you, when you're trying to manage all uh, this. You know, I think shutting a lot of the world out, you know, I've always kind of looked at it this way, you know, life is X plus Y equals Z. X is every one thing you can do something about. Y is everything you can't do anything about. Uh, and Z is the outcome. And most people get stuck worrying about why, you know, 80, 90% of the time I tend to try to ignore it. Cause if I have no control over it, it's irrelevant to me. Um, 
you know, people say, what's the hardest part about, you know, building the typhoon and, you know, all these engineering things go through my head and I'm like, well, you know, it wasn't that hard to learn all those things. I mean, it's just what I was doing. So I was passionate about it, but what's right. hard is, you know, your support system and your family and people around you are like, okay, is it done yet? And I'm like, <laughs> dude, it's a fucking first of, it's a first of its kind. How, what do you mean? Is it done yet? Uh, you know, and then it's kind of like the thing where, you know, people ask what you do for a living and think you don't have a job if you don't right. have a good answer. Um, you know, but they're like, oh, well, it's been two years, so it didn't work out, did it? I'm like, actually, it's working out just fine. Oh, so where are we? And the thing is, inevitably, they don't understand the answer anyhow. Right. So, um, and it goes back you know, to that people set that. their own expectations, right? They're, they're expecting yeah. you to like make this thing and then make a bunch of money off of it and go real big on social. And again, our culture is so set in our ways of our own expectations and, and, and like, I can kind of compare it to like in some sort of way, like with Robbie Gordon and his speed UTV and what he's doing is like, he, he kind of yeah. misdirected the expectations at the beginning and that kind of screwed everything up. But once he clarified everything, everyone's expectations never changed. Like they just expected him to overnight yeah. come up with this new UTV. Um, and so now he's starting to see the proof of it, you know, three, four years later, whatever it is. And you're yeah. starting to see the, the, the fruition of what you're doing three or four years later. Right. Um, and, and so especially when on entrepreneurial side, we're so used to seeing the word entrepreneurial tied to technology, like, you know, technology programming mm -hmm. websites or an app or whatever, where you can almost, you know, for the most part, you can see evidence of the work almost right away, right? Like you can, yeah. oh, you know, a month later you can install the app and yeah, there's nothing on it, but you can install it, right? Um, whereas with automotive, yeah. with logistics, with, with maritime, with, you know, uh, legal, with all these different things, sourcing, um, iteration, mm -hmm. it doesn't happen yeah. over a month, two months, a year. It happens over multiple years. And, uh, yeah. I'm super, ex I mean, like you said, I, I contacted you like way early on when I first saw the thing, I was like, yeah. this is, like I said, I had already been thinking about this years in advance, like right. this needs to happen. And, and, and my dreams were coming true. Like somebody was in my head. Um, <laughs> and so it's super cool to, to see the iterations happen, to understand the quality side. If you go back through the social feed of some of the pictures you guys have posted and videos you posted, you can get little sneak peeks of like the rear suspension and like the knuckles and like the yeah. linkage and like just that part of it yeah. alone. Will, like you can stare at it like for a while and yeah. still be oh, yeah. appreciative of what's happened there, let alone what's inside the hole or how the hole was made or, you know, the concept of this cage being part of the suspension yeah. and, and all that. I mean, there's so much to appreciate, but that doesn't happen overnight, especially even, even with a full team of engineers, yeah. it doesn't happen overnight. Right. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, and so with the full team of, yeah, yeah. I mean, people still get it wrong, even with all those people, it's just inevitable. Yeah. yeah. So I'm, I'm super so. stoked on what you're doing. I can't wait to see this crazy land to amphibious conversion tank thing happen. Um, and I'm super excited like to see cannons on it. <laughs> so right on. Um, <laughs> uh, maybe we can talk about torpedoes later. Um, and uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so uh, my sister works for Northrop Grumman, so we might be in luck. <laughs> oh man. I think though, I think the Tony Stark's happening. Do you, do you have any, well, you got your chest <laughs> right. exposed, so we're, we're, we're pretty safe there. Um, uh, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> so um, what, what is the future? I mean, so, okay. So to get back what I was saying about, that mental space, right? Yeah. I, one of the things yeah. that I wasn't to bring up was the fact that you find time to find uh, time with your passion of guitars. Like this is something that I do personally where, you know, I'm so yeah. tied up in this logistics, the technology, the interviews, the the industry events, all this different stuff. Yeah. And then you get escape of that and you do your stuff with your family. And then, but there's always that one yeah. thing that we all have that we have to escape yeah. with, right? Like that one thing that just brings us back to center. And, um, yeah. you know, I'm a musician. I've played, you know, most of my life. Um, I'm not anything exceptional. I'm not anything that anybody would want to proclaim as good. Uh, but I'm good enough to, to satisfy that center, right? And uh, for you, I mean, if you go follow your profile, like your individual profile, you'll see that you're one of the, you have one of the most <laughs> expansive metal guitar collections I've ever seen outside of, you know, big time musicians that just buy everything that they can, um, you know, kind of explain to me that, that, that part of your center and, and where that comes from and, and what that does for you. Yeah. So I've, I've been playing guitar since I was probably six, seven years old. And, uh, you know, I guess the thing that I got lucky with is I think my favorite thing about playing guitar is practicing. Um, you know, and I know that sounds strange, but 
I actually enjoy practicing to a metronome and I like the routine uh, side of things. And I like being able to do something where I can measure getting better at something every single day. Um, you know, and that kind of keeps my compass pointed in the right direction because you're right. I mean, if you're jumping into all these business things and doing all this other stuff, it's easy to want to quit pretty much most of the time. And, you know, it's easy to feel like you hate whatever you're doing, no matter what it is. Um, and so I always find that guitar for me has been this way of kind of bringing myself back to center uh, where, you know, I can set aside my half hour per day or hour per day and run through exercises, kind of pick different exercises and things I want to learn with. Um, but, you know, uh, you know, I went through a phase of playing in bands like yourself and, you know, you go out and once upon a time, uh, you know, you hit the road and, you know, there weren't Ubers and there weren't uh, all these other options for traveling around town. So you're on a bus or whatever and you get out and all right, then what the hell do you do next besides sit there? So it's a, it's a whole lot of hurry up and wait. And usually the common theme is a music store. And so uh, I just started buying guitars and, you know, it, it kind of never stopped. Um, you know, I think the guitar room is kind of a, uh, when I was a little kid and I was, you know, going into the music store and seeing all the guitars I really wanted and were way out of a price range that I was getting anything in, uh, you know, I, it just stuck with me forever. And I'm like, okay, I need to have a gem purple multicolor. I need to have the Steve Vai gem. <laughs> I need to have all of the John Petrucci guitars because I couldn't have them as a kid. So I'm right. getting them now. Uh, and I'll tell you what, man, it's taken a lifetime to actually get all those. I mean, it's just crazy stories of ending up in one place or another or hanging out with different musicians and just deciding to trade guitars. Uh, but, you know, ultimately, that's kind of my place of peace. Uh, it's kind of like an art studio, if you will, going in there. I mean, it, it's a music studio, but, uh, you know, people come over to my house and it's inevitably the one room that people go in and you know, it's hard to not really kind of have your face sort of glow being in there. Right. Um, you know, and so for me, that's, you know, guitar has always been that thing where, uh, you know, I get stressed out and uh, I find the best thing to do when you feel like quitting or you feel like getting, you know, you feel like you're getting overloaded with stress is realize that you're in that section of life where you can't do jack shit about it. And what you can do shit about is your chops. So go sit in front of the metronome <laughs> for 30 minutes you know, and take that 30 minutes for yourself where you control the world, you know, and I find usually in that 30 minutes, even though I wasn't thinking about whatever problem was seeming to be something I would never figure out, it's just right there. You know, I get done playing and I go, shit, we just need a joint that looks like this. Okay, let me sketch it on, you know. Right. Uh, but it's funny because, you know, if I were to sit there at a desk and try to force myself to come up with solutions, I don't think I could ever do it. I'd probably pull my hair out. Um, so, you know, guitar has always been huge from that perspective. And, you know, I highly recommend it to anybody and everybody because, you know, financial stuff is great in life, but you can't buy being a musician and you can't buy the feeling of getting better at something like music. Um, you know, maybe it's not for everybody, but, you know, I find it hard to believe that somebody would even uh, learn a little bit on an instrument and decide they don't like it or they right. don't enjoy the feeling they get of, of accomplishing a song they wanted to play or uh learning an instrument so that you know that they wanted to play yeah i have uh two boys that are now teenagers and and they've recently started to latch on to music and um you know it really changes kind of their um perspective on on what work means right so like yeah. all day long they're stuck in school and work means sitting down and being tortured versus yep. actually learning a skill and being able to um, replicate that in front of somebody and get the payoff of that appreciation. Um, and so, you know, they're, they're, they're starting to learn that appreciation right now. Um, one of them's focused on uh, percussion, one's focused on guitar, and they're, yes. they're kind of moving forward in that direction. And we were able to, you know, hand down some of these things. It's kind of like tools, right? If you get really good yeah. tools, you can hand sure. them down. Um, and same yeah. thing happens with these guitars and there's history there, right? Um, but on the same, on that same side that now flows into like one of my kids, you know, in his dirt bike, right? Like he's, he now thinks yeah. that he can go and learn and then replicate versus just waiting for yeah. dad to fix it. And I think that's super important yeah. is that whatever this thing is that you find center in, it usually is always tied to something that is like attached to a skill or to a mindset. Um, and yeah. the ability to, to do that and separate your mind and your physical from your day to day, 
you know, distractions or, and, and burdens, um, usually leads into us being more creative, being more, um, inspired. Um, and I think that it's like when I talk to people about being an off road, um, you know, my passion is in the experience. And it's in the idea yeah. that you can do something that you would no other in no other situation be able to replicate going out and yeah. driving into the mountains and smelling something and seeing something, you know, for yeah. for good or worse. Like it's an experience that you had you otherwise would yeah. not have had. And that's what I'm so drawn to this product of this this uh, aquatic razor style system is that yeah. you may have been on a jet ski. You may have been on, you know, a boat or even like the world's fastest boats or the world's craziest this or yeah. that. It's not going to be the same as this thing. Right. And yeah. um, that's why I think it's so cool to to have this like crossover between these industries where it's like it, it all comes down to that experience and something that you can personally identify with outside of anyone else's experience, because you can be on the same water as the guy next to you and come away with a completely different story. And just like with off road, Absolutely. you can be on the same dirt, the same trail and yeah. come back with a completely different story. And I think that's what's so cool about our industries. Yeah, no question about it. Um, you know, uh, that's the funny part about it. You know, everybody gets so worried about how their kids do in school and whether their you know days on or off. Pretty much all I really remember up until, you know, freshman year of high school, I guess, whenever it was that I met my wife. Uh, people are like, well, what did you want to be? Like, I really wasn't even thinking about it. I was picturing myself driving a banshee through the woods, you know, and pretty much that's what I was thinking all day, <laughs> just waiting <laughs> until school got out where I could go ride or play my guitar. So, yep, that's all that was going through my head. So don't worry, kids, if, if you don't have it figured out yet, <laughs> there's plenty of time to figure out whatever you want. So with uh, with the, the vehicles you're working on, with the, the shop that you guys have, are building out there, you know, where can, obviously we can go to social media and we can follow you guys. Shadow Six Racing is where everything's at. Um, yeah. Where did Shadow Six Racing, where did that name come from? Uh, so there was already a number of different Shadow Six entities. Um, I've got a lot of different things I'm into. One of my other big passions is long guns. Um, and so... I had put together sort of a, you know, Shadow Six Industries, which was a parent company, um, you know, and then, you know, as so many people started becoming interested in the Typhoon and it started becoming so much more of a, I think I want to push this, the consumer direction, um, but I, you know, I kind of fully made that shift. You know, I guess something I hadn't mentioned, um, you know, earlier on in the project, a buddy of mine who ran a, um, a defense hedge fund had come to me and said, you know, Right now, you know, the military is looking to replace the LARV or the LARV, which is, uh, I don't know if you've seen duck boats before, mm -hmm. but uh, it's essentially an amphibious truck that uh, they take people for tours on, but they were used a lot in Vietnam. And in 2017, um, you know, I guess one of them goes out in a storm and there are two of them. And I don't know if you recall, but uh, the thing ended up flipping over and sinking and trapping everybody inside. Oh, wow. So that leads to this thing needs replaced. And so, um, you know, I'm kind of telling my buddy, you know, well, the thing is, I wouldn't really compare the Typhoon to uh, an LARV. And I don't know that I want to make it amphibious or anything. I, you know, my goal is to just be the very best on the water. That's right. it. You know, you start adding the best on land, too. And you end up with probably what you saw uh, with the fold up tires, which is like an OK four wheeler and an OK jet ski. I want to like, holy shit, razor on the water. Right. You know, that's what I want. Not, not one that drives up on the beach for me and only goes 10 miles an hour. Um, but you know, the, the, as I started speaking with them, uh, you know, they kind of indicated, well, yep, that's not necessarily for this project, but hell yeah, we're definitely interested in that for shallow water operations, right. uh, extreme surf rescue, things like that. Um, well, I mean, you look it, at it, it they, does, ha they have an M razor already. They have, you know, kind of like the conversion yeah. of the off-road stuff yeah. to what their application is. There's no reason why this wouldn't be a super useful tool in that application. Yeah. I mean, it's the versatility, the fact that you can chase, you know, a boat smuggling people or whatever, and let it get a lot closer to shore and not have to stress out about the uh, shallow water. And now once you fly up on them at 80 miles an hour and blow off their engines with a shotgun, you know, you're telling this vessel a lot less distance and you're in a much safer environment. Uh, so, you know, I guess let the bad guys use their gas up and then 
you know, yeah. sneak right up on them and this solves that problem. Um, so how, how other, soon do we see the, the military six door armored version with a cannon and a turret? All right. So the good <laughs> news is, uh, with my sister working at Northrop, I am certain that we can quickly and readily adapt their cannon to pop right on the top <laughs> of, the, of this thing. So it's, it's already ready to be armed. Um, we just need a titanium you know, cannon. That's all. Yeah, I think that would be cool. I mean, I don't know if they would see the need for it, but I mean, eh, whatever. You know, fortunately, they can take those off and throw them away and do whatever they like. But, uh, you know, so we're kind of at the point now where, um, like I said, we built up the jig to manufacture frames and put these things out at a large level. And our plan is to ramp up pretty quickly. Um, there's a bit of a backlog of people that are pre existing. And, um, you know, one of the things that's happened, fortunately or unfortunately, uh we've ended up directing quite a few sales overseas um a lot of that has to do with uh product liability insurance mm -hmm. um i want to offer product liability insurance i don't like the idea of having a, a hold harmless clause or something along those lines right it may come down to it but um you know it, it's kind of tricky because you know i think the cheapest quote i got was somewhere around one hundred twenty-five thousand a year uh for insurance and you know i get it if i was to go out and, and bring on a bunch of investors or whatnot but i think that could seriously jeopardize the quality of what the company builds you know and it's not so much about anything financial it's again i want to build the very best of what we're building and that's all that really matters to me you know well i mean when there's already something. so many sport cars that are only overseas right like there's so yeah. many high performance yeah. cars that they they're just so extreme they don't fit inside of yeah. our uh north american like standards and and liability yeah. laws and all that stuff so it's not like a new concept right this is just something that yeah. is a logistics yeah. nightmare for anyone in, in north america right yeah you know, well, the good news is they've kind of said, you know, look, you know, get the first day out there and let the first eight guys drive them around. And if we have no problems, it'll be a whole different story. Um, and so, you know, I think we'll be there pretty quickly where we'll have product liability figured out. Um, we have a couple of other options that, that work decently. Um, the good news is I've got Dave Bamdas, who's the uh, CEO of Riva Motorsports. Um, and they're the world's largest personal watercraft dealership. They also are the leading uh, leading aftermarket parts manufacturer for personal watercraft. Um, so I kind of follow his lead on on what we do sales wise. They've been kind of following up with everybody, um, you know, dealing with putting people in line and figuring out who's going to get what when. But uh, you know, one of the things that was sort of critical that we did uh, over this past year is three D scan our hulls and three D scan all of our parts and. Uh, you know, we are in the process of working with uh, design concepts and marine concepts. And so uh, we're at a point now where rather than building halls by hand and having tons of hours involved in it, right. uh, we can have a company mass produce them for us. And that gets them out a lot more quickly than we could otherwise get them out. Right. Um, you know, you can't cut corners in the manufacturing of the halls or any of the things we're doing. But, you know, fortunately, there are companies that have the capability to, to produce at a mass level very quickly and safely and um, you know, allow us to have a product that I think is worth selling to people. You know, the issue is the time involved with building these things by hand is not worth it from a profitability standpoint unless you have mass production capabilities. And so, um, right. again, it's one of these things where, uh, you know, everybody thinks, OK, well, you know, you're making, you know, 200,000 if you sold it for 250 and that is definitely not the case. <laughs> how uh, many hours are, have you guys calculated how many man hours are into these vehicles? Shit. Uh, I don't know if I've ever calculated a total and you know part of it is <laughs> you know, we have race tech actually you know doing the fabrication of the hulls or I'm doing, doing the fabrication of the um, the chassis and suspension and then you know internally we're looking at about 100 hours per ski in just manufacturing the hulls um, because it's significantly different than a uh, traditional wave runner hall and uh, traditional wave runner hall doesn't have any of the mounting abilities that, you know, the skis that we make do in terms of adapting suspension. Uh, you know, you've probably noticed um, where, you know, when I put that first design out there, it was just kind of showing people, yes, we're protected. We've done our homework for IP, but um, you know, there's no longer a metal cage inside. 
and a lot of it just had to do with dialing and weight and uh, balance and you know a whole bunch of things that sort of got dictated to us throughout the process of building right so um is there is there anything that you're looking forward? I sorry, I was just looking at the the little kid version, yeah. the little blow up skis with the, oh. <laughs> <laughs> the I tiny typhoon. The tiny typhoon, yes. Um, yeah. <laughs> but uh, the is there anything that's coming up with in the next year that you know? Obviously, manufacturing starting to ramp up. You're starting to move into that part of the business cycle. Yeah. Um, and I know yeah. you have ideas every other day about something different, new improved whatever yeah. um and we've talked a little bit about this little ripsaw um version of a vehicle that can be amphibious and and all that is there anything that's coming up this year whether that be events whether that be uh model upgrades or launches things like that that you're looking forward to that's gonna you know kind of enter you into anything new and exciting uh i would say inevitably yes that's going to happen as a result of even just the 3d scanning um, you know, when you're doing hauls by hand, it doesn't give you the ability to go through all of your engineering work in a virtual world. And we can't just 3D print a mold. Whereas now, if we need to move something by any certain one one thousandth of an inch or 10 feet for that matter, uh, it could all be done in a computer. And so the precision is there and things are exact. That allows us very quickly to move into stretching the vehicle out, six year versions, um, alternative means of power. Um, you know, we're looking at, uh, you know, moving into, uh, creating, you know, essentially a nitrogen fuel cell for electric vehicles. That way we're not dealing with weight, but, uh, you know, one of the big things I think that's going to happen is that people will finally start being able to get these things and they'll be out there on the marketplace as opposed to sort of this unicorn out there in, in social media. Yeah. So I'm super excited yeah. to see what, you know, uh, as far as product development and, and manufacturing, you know, the real test is when people get them in their hands. Right. And like yeah. you, you, no matter what you do, you always have this like hesitation in, in your subconscious. That's, I'm not going to do that. This is our one and only prototype or this is, I'm not going to do that. Oh, that would be me. stupid, but <laughs> no way. I finally was like, shit, this is going to get tons of views. And like all these people hate and say shit. So I'm going balls to the damn wall so nobody can say a damn thing. And it doesn't even matter because they're just like, okay, fine. Well, now it can't fly. Like, okay, fine. You got me there. It can't fly, you know, but it can fly off a wave. So it right. does for a little bit. <laughs> so, so and then everybody wants me to roll it over. Like, you know, you, you roll over your Lamborghini. Yeah. Well, the, I, I just, I envision my head, like the idea that, you know, side by sides in my industry have taken off so much in the UA um, oh, yeah. and the, they do so many crazy things over there with their off-road vehicles. You know, they, yeah. they'll blow nitrous into a 2000 horsepower motor yeah. on a thousand pound vehicle and say, yeah, that's normal. Like it, it, they just do yeah, weird right? stuff. Right. And so I'm, I'm just excited to see what happens with, especially just because it's such a unique vehicle and the opportunities for new content that no one's ever seen before is so open, right? Um, I'm excited to see all that happen. And I'm, I was curious about, you guys have done so much like organic posting and you had a couple of times where you've yeah. invested in an actual filmer to come out and, and, and create some content yeah. around your, your vehicle. Um, you know, what was the process there? Was that just an opportunity that you took or, or are you looking to get into more of that kind of cinematic push into showcasing this these vehicles you know um when we put together that first cinematic sort of setup it was just showing people what we had because i mean you can see it on an iphone but until you really start following it around and try to come up with ways to keep up with it to even film it um it's a whole nother experience and so that first video was kind of a teaser to i guess open the door to the right people which it did a very good job of doing that but um essentially that video for us was ta-da now you can meet anybody you want to meet by showing them this video and they're going to listen to you about this thing because they're going to think it's badass so far i haven't seen anybody watch that video i mean other than the trolls people in comments i've never actually <laughs> truthfully yeah i've never really seen somebody watch it and be like oh boy that looks stupid and sure that wouldn't be fun you know they Pretty also they also drive priuses companies. so yeah exactly there you go <laughs> yeah the coast guard told me they were like you know i have a, a truck on 46s and when they were here, they're like, thank God you didn't roll around in a Prius. We, just, like, <laughs> we felt like there was going to be something wrong with you or like you're hiding something from us. So as long as you don't have a cat, you don't drive a Prius. We're good. <laughs> yeah, no. I don't have a cat and I don't drive a Prius. Oh, I think I drive man. the opposite. <laughs> 
I was going to say, you know, I think in terms of content and things, uh, things of that nature, we're going to plan on doing a hell of a lot more. Um, the reason you haven't seen a lot of that right now is just uh, the unit that you saw for SEMA is sold. And so, uh, you know, we're kind of in a situation where I think I would be pissed if somebody took it and launched it off a 12 foot wave and then sold it to me as a brand new vehicle, um, especially when it's, you know, number one in the series. But, um, you know, the good thing is anybody who purchases any of the vehicles can push it to its limits. It doesn't have that point where if you go around and turn too fast, it rolls over. It doesn't flip. I mean, it's it's something that you can get into. And uh, it's more like a Mercedes Benz where you're like, holy shit, I'm going 85 miles an hour or whatever, you know, across waves. And I didn't even realize I was going that fast. Right. Uh, or, you know, you get going and you have that pit in your stomach like, oh shit, we just launched over something that was six feet tall and that, that's going to hurt when we land. Uh, but it's like a cushion. So, you know, whereas, you know, you buy a GP 1800 and you put a 60 year old woman on it, uh, you know, not much <laughs> is going to happen. You throw her behind in the seat of one of these and she'll be able to drive right with a NASCAR driver. Uh, anybody else for that matter. It's, you know, it's super usable in that way. So it's exciting to have something where uh, anybody can get behind the driver's seat and experience something that is abnormal, like, you know, nitrous on a 3000 horsepower buggy. I mean, you know, do you want that every day? I mean, that might be pushing it a little bit, but it's still an experience that not everybody gets to have. Right. Um, now, you know, what I've tried to do is bottle that up into a consumer level slash race level, you know, product where it's reliable. It runs all the time. It's not going to break on you. There's no ridiculous maintenance schedule, but you know, you can set it on the front of a mega yacht or you can park it behind your house and it's not going to fall apart and rust to pieces. Um, you know, they're made to last the test of time. You throw the frame in the ocean, you can pull it out 10 years later and it won't have a bit of rust on it. Right. So I was just thinking in the back so. of my head that, you know, in so much of, uh, the, the filming world, like you're starting to see these, um, these razors and X3s and stuff come out with like the big boom arms, with the cameras on them. And they're starting to do a lot yep. of this cool stuff where they weren't able to film previously because the vehicles that could do it didn't exist. And I'm super excited to see the first one of these with a big old, you know, gimbaled cameras hanging off the side of it, following some sort of cool, you know, vehicle that's being filmed on the water or something like that for some show or something. It's, it's definitely going to be super cool. I might have to catch. Yeah. I might have to catch up with you on, uh, things that are capable of doing it. I was told that, uh, a military drone pilot that flew with us the other day would be able to hold up with me no problem and you know we had some discussions and supposedly it was because of the wind and i'm like dude <laughs> the part where i blow your doors off is actually going with the wind right. and i hate to break it to you but the reason that it's different going that way is i was going around a turn when you stayed with me and then i went into a straightaway right. <laughs> so in the turn you know i'm doing 70 and that's why you're doing circles spinning around me then that's why you saw me disappear when i hit you know the straightaway yeah but uh i mean i haven't seen a drone yet i mean maybe you can tell me about them or or a gimbal on something or a helicopter for that matter right you know i, I think out on the ocean i don't I'm, I'm just not sure how to capture some of that for people yeah you know the problem is uh you know, when I, if I want to film launching over waves at extremely high speeds, what am I going to film that from? You right. know, I have a pontoon boat, but I don't want to be out in the, the rough ocean in my pontoon boat. <laughs> uh, it's a tri -tune, but even still, like, no bueno. <laughs> and, I mean, you know, no, if that's, you got that's what another I'm saying is that you space, have to actually make the car to film the car. Like, you know what I mean? Like, you oh, have to. <laughs> got it. Oh, man. Here we go. Another starting line again. <laughs> Damn it. <laughs> And I, I'm fully signed on board to come help you test it. So right. you let me know. <laughs> we do need something like that. Yeah. So that is the, the missing in, uh, invention, I guess, so far. I, I'm thinking a plane that tracks, you know, realistically is probably going to be the only way that I can do it. Like an RC airplane. It's got a yeah. large battery. and Yeah, probably you're, you're probably going to end up looking at um, just the idea that you're gonna have to have the super high performance FPV drones do it, that the batteries don't last very long. So it's like one or two shots yeah. and that's it. But, uh, and then they can't get out there. Well, you but know, they would the they'd they'd have to be out there with you, the right? That's what I'm saying. You got to build yeah. the car to shoot yeah, the car yeah, to yeah. film the car. <laughs> yeah, yep, exactly. Uh, so where can we follow you guys? Where can we, um, you know, keep up with what you're doing and the crazy adventures you're going on with these things? Um, and, uh, you know, just kind of see it evolve and, and become what it, it has, has already become, but will, will become as you start to launch in these, these new vehicles and the end production. 
Yeah, so I think, uh, you know, we'll always continue to do a lot of stuff on Instagram and on TikTok. Um, and YouTube. You know, the problem is it's, or I'm sorry, uh, YouTube, we've done a little bit. YouTube is the place where I've done nothing other than speed upload crap, basically, from uh, shorts and things that I downloaded out of Instagram. Um, the crazy part is I've got probably hundreds and hundreds of hours of insane footage that's all shot sideways that I haven't used for anything, you know, only because it's always been one of those, we got to get back and, you know, do some more stuff on YouTube. Right. Um, the challenge is, you know, I, I go through experiences in my day-to-day -day life and I'm like, why the hell would anybody want to see this? <laughs> and then, you know, I meet people and they're like, holy shit, dude, if someone followed you with a camera, you'd be the richest YouTuber on the planet. Like, you'd do crazy <laughs> shit. And I'm like, okay. And they're like, you know, it's fun, you know, it's whatever. Like, you wouldn't even really have to do anything. You just have to let somebody follow you with a camera. Yep. And so, um, you know, it's weird because people think that that's what's happening with our social media stuff, but it's not. It's just okay, like it's not hard for us to come with come up with ideas to have fun or build things or, you know, make little props or do whatever we like. So uh, we've got a lot of resources here in the shop. And now I think, um, you know, I, one of the first things I'll probably do is uh, like we've talked today, uh, sort of the story of, you know, how I ended up deciding to build it. Uh, who was involved in, in helping make that happen. Some of the video I have over the course of making different prototypes and getting to this point, um, you know, sort of sharing just how much there was to the journey. Cause you know, I've always had this fear that there's going to be a dude who's like, Oh, fantastic idea. Razor on two jet skis. I'm going to go buy a brand new razor, rip out the engine and strap it to two jet skis. And that person's probably going to die and somehow I'll get bad publicity from it. <laughs> but uh, I truly hope nobody tries that. It, it is not a good idea. And every troll who believes that's what's been done would be completely accurate if that was actually what had been done. <laughs> but, um, you know, I think we'll probably do a little bit of documentary style stuff, just kind of walking people through even a lot of the early posts and fun things we did. Um, a lot of it had been captured. And, you know, I had always struggled with, are we are we worried about social media or are we manufacturers? And so, you know, my firm answer for myself is we're manufacturers, you know, and that has to be priority number one. Um, as quality control and infrastructure fall together as they have been, and as units get shipped out of the door and there's a little bit more time for fun, uh, at that point I intend to go to a hell of a lot more events. Um, hopefully this year we'll hit them. You know, I hate to commit long in advance because I find that, you know, it's just, you know, I commit to a certain date and then the Coast Guard says, okay, we're flying nine guys in from Washington to check this thing out. And that's right. the time we're coming. And, you if know, we could so you're going to have, have those problems. <laughs> it's strange. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it seems like the perfect life, but I assure you, it sucks just as much as everyone else's. <laughs> I just have some cool toys. So uh, we've already but, gone yeah. two hours. I think that's probably enough for everybody across the country listening. Um, so we can follow you. Everything is at Shadow Six Racing, you know, as far as social medias go and, and Shadow Six Racing dot com. I know you haven't put a lot of uh, stuff on the on the website yet and all that stuff. But if, if someone's interested, um, you know, in what you're doing and, and maybe even purchasing a vehicle, uh, how would they go about doing that? So uh, the shop that you see that kind of looks like, uh, well, you see around me uh, uh, merchandise on some of the shelves or whatnot. So we put together a smaller facility that uh, is essentially uh, just assembly. So there isn't a lot of real fabrication going on, maybe welding a tab back on or whatnot, uh, you know, little things like that. But um, we've got a facility here in West Palm Beach. And so for now, uh, we bring people in, we can take it out on a test lake behind our shop. And that's where people can kind of get an experience of, of driving and whatnot. I think uh, most likely inside of six months from now, you'll have one sitting down at Riva uh, Motorsports in Pompano Beach, Florida. And, uh, you know, I'm not sure how exactly they'll run uh, test drives or whatnot, but this facility will always be here. And, you know, when there are buyers that are serious or enthusiasts, um, you know, that are serious, I mean, certainly uh this is a place that you can come and you know we can show you the vehicles we can drop them in the water show you what they do um you know at this point we're not really interested in even some of the absurd amounts of money we've been offered for rentals um you know again it's keep it to the people in the industry people that are serious about it if they want to come see it you know that's fine but you know 
uh, for the rest of the country and the rest of the world, you know, again, that'll probably be a process that occurs over the course of a year or so, uh, maybe two years to where uh, people can readily come and drive one if they want and not have to worry about renting or anything like that. Well, I'm super excited. Um, I, I'm, you know, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a passive viewer of a lot of this stuff, right? Like I can't come down and, and fly yeah. overnight and, you know, buy yeah. one of these things, but I, I thoroughly enjoy <laughs> no the worries. idea. <laughs> I thoroughly enjoy well, the you idea. Know, I that, like that you post the patent. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah the, the, and that you actually caught onto a bunch of things. Oh yeah. No, it, it's, I'm Smart super people curious. jump out at me. <laughs> <laughs> well, I appreciate the yeah. uh, vote of confidence there. Um, the, yeah. <laughs> I'm super excited when someone can provide a new experience and a new thing that people haven't done before, especially when it relates in some way to off-road and, you know, water yeah. is off-road, right? So the, the idea that we're, we're seeing such cool, unique things happen, um, obviously technology plays a huge part in that, like where we've come from, right? This wouldn't have been able to exist 15 years ago. And sure. I think that um, as we progress, it's super important to um, just kind of pay attention and, and follow people along for the ride because this stuff is so cool. Um, you know, I enjoy it. I know other people enjoy it. So <laughs> obviously social media uh, is proof of that. Go ahead. You guys are definitely what keeps the motivation to make it keep on going. That's for sure. Yeah, you know, um, you know it, it's tough to get all this stuff started from the ground up, but seeing how happy people get and just joy from watching the thing in a video, you know, sort of blows my mind. And it's cool to be able to do that and, uh, you know, frankly, do it while I'm sleeping. So, uh, <laughs> you know, it, it's nice. I guess it, it's the equivalent of what I care about and getting paid while you sleep because right. you know, financially I'm OK. But uh, being able to make people smile around the world because they're all on different you know, time zones. And knowing that, you know, people are checking stuff out and, you know, seeing something that they've never seen before, uh, getting excited about thinking about driving it, you know, it's definitely a, a very cool thing. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's, uh, you know, people always ask me about my legacy and things like that. And you know, frankly, I could care less what my legacy is because I'm dead, in my opinion. But, uh, you know, why I'm here, being able to, you know, have a guy like yourself who has probably seen it all in terms of side by sides come out here and witness, you know, your first experience with something like it is, it's something like I said, money can't buy. You know, right. it's, a, it's definitely an awesome feeling to have that, that validation of somebody who really knows what they're talking about, come in and, you know, experience and understand just how much work and effort and energy and all kinds of things, sacrifice <laughs> and many angles for many people, you know, many people's families that had to deal with people staying up late through the night, working out problems. But, uh, you know, it's cool to see now something that can be delivered to put a smile on people's faces and that uh, hopefully we can continue to sort of evolve the world of motorsports and stand it on its head and make it new again. Because I feel like it has not had very much innovation. Uh, you know, the last big thing was the side by side, and it is probably one of the most magnificent things ever to come out. Um, I think that's why it's won the popularity contest. Right. But, uh, you know, our goal is to kind of continue to create things that are, are like the typhoon that sort of break the barriers and open up new ways to have fun and um you know that that deal with the things like having your trail shut down and being told you can't right. drive your side by side here or there or you can't put an exhaust on it or you can't you know do this or that um you know the good news is there's a future for everybody and you know as long as you live by a body of water you can drive a heck of a lot more places trail wise and a lot more distance on water uh, than you can on land and this as a side by side. Well, I'm super stoked. Um, obviously awesome. you guys have, uh, some super cool ideas coming out and I can't wait to see those as well. Cause obviously the thought and the, and the effort that goes into manufacturing these, uh, in the, in this, this hybrid thing, you know, shows as, as evident. And so we can only assume that the next thing's going to be just as good. Right. And, uh, super excited to see that and, uh, can't wait to maybe one day get down there and see everything and, um, experience that. And, and, and even just bring, maybe even bring the, the filming side of it, like just to show yeah. that to the community would be super cool. Yeah. Um, Absolutely. and, uh, for, for, for you guys, everyone can follow you Sh shadow six racing at shadow six racing, YouTube, Instagram, TikTok all those places um for the podcast you guys can follow us anywhere uh podcasts are apple google uh iheart radio all the different shop uh, spotify um all those different places you can follow us there um if you think you enjoy this content give us a thumbs up and a, and a five star if you can if not uh cool keep listening so until the next time guys peace